I'd like to welcome everybody to the September 20th, 24 uh, ad hoc committee to review and assess zoning and review the town's use of regulatory agreements. I'd like to uh, start with a roll call, Cynthia. Members of the committee, Ken Alsman. Here. Catherine Ledeck. Here. Councillor Charles Bloom. Here. Councillor Kristen Turkelson. Here. Councillor John Crow. Here. Councillor Matthew Levesque. Councillor Jeffrey Mendes. And Seth Antieni. Here. Chair of Committee, Bob Schulte. Here. You have quorum. Thank you. I'd like to start by uh, saying this meeting is being recorded and will be rebroadcast on the Town of Barnstable's Government Access Channel in accordance with Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 30A, Section 20. I must inquire whether anyone else is recording this meeting, and if so, to please make their presence known. Looks like we're good. Uh, this meeting will be replayed, uh, uh, is being broadcast and replayed via Xfinity Channel 18 or on High Definition Channel 1072. It may also be accessed via the Government Access Channel uh, live video on demand, the archives on the Town of Barnstable's website. Thank you. Uh, I'd start by reading uh, the purpose of the committee. Just a reminder that our job, our charter, is to work with the town's planning and development staff to review and reassess recently adopted zoning changes, review the town's use of regulatory agreements, and make recommendations to the council. As we get to the point where we have uh, public comment, just a reminder um, that once public comment is closed, the Zoom link will close, uh, but you'll continue to be able to watch it on channel 18. However, I will point out that we'll have a brief public comment uh, early on, and then we will reopen public comment uh, after uh, Mr. Florence's presentation, as I expect there'll be some questions and comments. So uh, there will be two opportunities for public comment. Just want to start by, again, thanking everyone for uh, joining us today, both in person and via Zoom. We appreciate the public's interest in the committee and its work. I want to give particular thanks to uh, Brian Florence, the town's director of inspectional services, for joining us today. We're looking forward to his presentation a little bit later. As always, we encourage the public to provide input and comments either in person, via Zoom, or by email. As always, written comments can be sent to Cynthia Lovell at Cynthia, C Y N T H I A dot Lovell, L O V E L L, at town dot barnstable dot M A dot U S. Cynthia will forward any comments she receives to all of the committee members. Uh, regarding housekeeping, I have no items unless someone else from the committee has any comments, thoughts? Okay, thank you. Uh, we will uh, start uh, with, go to uh, item B, which is correspondence from the public. Uh, in your packets today, uh, you have an email from Mr. Chris Kuhn dated September 19th that was sent to all of the town councilors as well as to the members of this committee. You might recall that Mr. Kuhn was uh, one of the original members of the committee appointed uh, by the appointments committee, but was not able to make the meetings given other commitment. So uh, he has uh, had said that he would continue to participate uh, as a member of the public and uh, had sent a letter in. For anyone who hasn't read, uh, had a chance to read it yet, uh, Mr. Kuhn, just a brief summary, posed uh, a number of very interesting questions regarding the number of new housing units that have been recently permitted versus the number of units that will actually be needed. He commented that there has been little successful effort in bringing new good paying jobs year round to Barnstable and without more jobs, he asked who will be able to afford the, to rent or buy the new mostly market rate housing that is being proposed to be built. Mr. Kuhn commented that he felt the number of housing units and dwellings that have been permitted and are proposed will outnumber the available jobs that occupants will need to be able to afford to live in them. While I assume everyone's been reading the public correspondence that Cynthia has provided us, uh, I would urge you all to please read Mr. Kuhn's email. Whether you agree or disagree with his points, I believe he's posed a number of interesting questions and issues that should be discussed by this committee as we continue. With that, uh, I guess any, any comments or response from anybody to public comment, uh, the letters there? I guess we'll wait till we do the public comment. So uh, with that, I guess we'll go to item C, which is to uh, open the meeting to public comment. As I mentioned, uh, we will also reopen it following Mr. Florence's presentation. So uh, with that, do we have any members in the room that would like to comment publicly?
Hi, how are you today? Uh, Eric Schwab from Hyannis. Uh, we have a, a new public comment person uh, who's never commented before uh, since John Klim was a uh, town manager. Uh, but she's as outraged as many of us are with what's going on in the streets of Hyannis. Uh, I myself, you know, came home today after two days in Boston, and there was an enormous trailer full of construction debris parked directly in front of my house. So that was my uh, welcome to Hyannis. Uh, and this was a property that the uh, Brian has worked with and has done an excellent job cleaning up, uh, but it's back. And the reason it's back, it keeps coming back, uh, is lack of enforcement. Uh, Brian probably doesn't have enough people. Uh, we looked at some of the code. Uh, we looked at the street parking regulations would need to be changed. The other thing I'd like you to consider is taking a look at the buy rights zoning. Uh, buy rights zoning uh, is causing some concerns here downtown with the form-based zoning, but buy rights zoning is also allowed in the neighborhoods. And there, pretty much anyone can hang their shingle and park their trucks and go to work in a residential neighborhood. Uh, buy rights zoning uh, has been in hands for quite some time, it's not new, but was recently extended to uh, the western part of town. And everyone talks about, oh, you know, we want to extend the buy rights zoning to the western part of town because we want people to have, you know, a pottery shop in their backyard. Well, you know, we're not getting pottery shops. You know, we're getting uh, landscapers, we're getting excavation trucks, uh, we're getting fleet trucks, uh, and these just show up one day and buy right. And there's no review process. Like when you pull a DBA from the town clerk, the, the building commissioner is notified, but this, and on occasion he will push back, but there's no requirement that a, a new business owner go to planning or go to the ZBA and say, hey, I'm gonna open a business with 10 trucks in my front yard, is that okay? You know, there is no requirement that these businesses register with the town other than file a DBA. If they go directly to the state and get an LLC, no one knows about it until people start complaining. There's no notification to the town for someone doing business in a neighborhood if you have an LLC. So what we would like you to do as part of the zoning review is to consider eliminating all by right zoning, at least pause it, and create a process of your choosing to approve businesses who want to set up shop in a residential neighborhood. I mean, if the address on the application is a residential neighborhood, uh, then it should be regulated. And there's a number of reasons for this. I was watching the site re review committee uh, next to Independence House the other day, and there was great effort made to say, oh, the lighting will never you know, cross the border. We have special zoning for lighting. Well, yes, you do, in commercial areas. I have a guy with a with an equipment yard behind me who has a spotlight that shines right into my bedroom. There's no special lighting for these buy right businesses that are operating in residential neighborhoods. There are no special noise restrictions. There's no parking, right? So again, the easiest way to get ahead of this and help Mr. Florence and help the building inspector, just put a pause on this buy right zoning until you get a handle on it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Schwab. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I don't really know all the rules here, but I, um, ha I live in Hyannis and I'm quite frustrated with the folks that live across the street from me. Can you state your name and village? Oh, I'm sorry, Patty Murray. Patty Murray, thank you. Sorry, and um, I, the family that lives across the street from me, it's more than one family. There's probably four or five families that live in the house. I don't know what can be done about that. There's an RV in the yard with a family living in it. Um, I wake up in the morning and there are at least eight cars in the driveway, often some trucks that are from a landscaping business. They were also parking in front of my house, which I've had to 
multiple times, go out and ask them to leave. I had to put up no parking signs. The gentleman that lives next door owns the fish market. He has the same frustration with them just parking in his yard, which he has ended. Um, there's no consideration of when they start their lawn mowing at like 7.15 in the morning. There's late hour parties with no consideration for neighbors. I have called the police a few times. Um, but it's getting to the point where it's out of control and I'm starting to get so angry that I've, it's just awful. Um, but I don't know if we can do anything about that. Can we check to find out how many families are living in the house? Um, can we put restrictions? And they sometimes double park in the road, so there's only one passageway for a car to go by. Is there anything that we can do about that? I don't know. Thank you, Ms. Murray. Um, hopefully, uh, we'll get some answers to some of those in uh, Mr. Florence's presentation, but appreciate coming and sharing okay. Thank your you. concerns there. Thank you. Would you like my name on the record? Sure, good right. afternoon Larry for the Moore record, thank Katua. you. I wasn't gonna say anything, but uh, this, what these, uh, both, what both uh, Eric and Patty have said is very commonplace. Uh, it's pretty much scattered all over the place in Barnstable. Um, some of it's on Old Stage Road, for instance, uh, going up from uh, uh, Centerville on up into wherever it goes. But my thought is, is that uh, the concept I think that they're advocating for is what I would call a prevention or a forbidden type of use. And so that may be a category that you could easily put together uh, in rough terms. Um, and I think the other question is, is how do you get uh, somebody to go around and check throughout the town and identify these places as they existed, whether or not a complaint has come in? And the third thing is that I'm glad Brian's here because he's here on enforcement, but I've known him for a, a long time, and I think that maybe he can offer some thoughts about that very concept. He may have rehearsed it anyway, but I think that, that this is a very concise topic. I think it's timely presented. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Warren. Anybody else in the room like to make a comment? All right, I think uh, we have someone on Zoom, Cynthia? Yes, you do, Ms. Hunt. It'll just take a few minutes for uh, her to, there she is, Whoop. there she is. Hi, it's Heather Hunt to give public comment. I didn't know if you were ready for me. We're ready, thank you, Ms. Hunt. Go ahead. Oh, and I apologize for not being there. I just zoomed in from from out of town and wasn't able to make it over there. Um, before I give just very brief com comment on two issues, I, I just wanted to commend this committee for, for its meetings. You've had just really great discussion that have been educational, I think, for the public. And, and I think there's a lot of appreciation for, for that. Um, you had two items on your agenda today that I had some interest in. So I'll, I'll just give brief comment on each. One pertains to zoning enforcement. Um, I had gone to the town code committee to give similar comment, and I thought it was appropriate to come just very briefly, give the same to you. And that is, I, I would encourage you at the end of the day in connection with zoning enforcement to have as an objective, um, including a clear, plain English explanation in our town code and on our town website of what residents who seek zoning enforcement are entitled to from the town and by when. And that is so real people can understand uh, their rights and the town's obligations in plain, simple words. And just the quickest possible uh, backstory, I, I have the experience of asking for zoning enforcement and, and getting a letter from the town that basically said, we intend to act on this one day. Um, and then no action at, at any point in time. Um, I, I asked, you know, let me know if I'm right. Let me know if I'm wrong. Just let me know. No, no response. And I, that also blocks any legal action. It blocked an appeal. I, I, I 
was so sort of frustrated by that. I, I spent the money um, taking that question to court, and ultimately a judge said, no, the town actually has to be responsive to citizens. Um, no one should ever have to go through that. So that is the basis for my request that the town code ultimately provides very, very simple, clear, plain words to people to explain what they're entitled to and by when. And I would also add to that, um, if there is an evidentiary burden that the town shifts to residents when they ask for certain enforcement to make that clear too. Um, I, I had the experience of getting in writing, you know, uh, an assertion that I hadn't provided a certain kind of evidentiary burden. If there is such a burden on, on residents, and I don't believe there is, it should be spelled out super clearly so that everyone just knows what, what their obligations are from the get-go. Um, and then second, just a quick word on the form-based code matter. I appreciate that you're all talking about that again. If you didn't have a chance to watch the last site plan review meeting, um, I would really encourage you to take 30 minutes to do that. I thought it was really illuminating um, about the issue that I'll speak to, and that is kind of the public awareness, public understanding, and support of form-based code from the get-go. Um, back, back at the the outset of the form-based code process way back, I recall the town consultant said, because development is by right, it's really critical to have um, kind of a full public understanding, support, and buy-in, because once it's in place, it's all by right. It's a done deal. Um, I'm going to respectfully suggest that actually never really happened, right? There was a public process survey that 1% of hyenas responded to, and it was pictures. It wasn't about zoning. Um, I, I actually think people are smart enough to, to at, be asked questions about their zoning preferences and then answer those questions. Um, there were public forums where 10 and 30 people showed up, and that included counselors and staff. Um, that That isn't really reaching the actual public. Um, and, and some of the public, candidly, it was me, it was Felicia Penn, it was Tina Carey. It, it wasn't sort of a broad-based, real kind of public input and understanding. Um, I know that's really hard to do, but I just encourage that um, outreach in the strongest possible way before doing anything at all by right. And I, and I really appreciate that you're looking to maybe make some adjustments to kind of right, right the ship that maybe the lack of public process didn't quite reach. Thanks for taking the time to listen to me today. Thank you, Ms. Arnold. Anyone else then on Zoom, Cynthia? I think are we good? No, that is it. Okay. Great, then we'll go ahead and close the public comment for now, but again, we will reopen it uh, following the presentation. Um, I just want to make a quick note, uh, Attorney Kate Connolly has joined us now, and uh, Director uh, uh, Jim Kupfer, Director of Planning and Development, is also here today. So thank you both for being here. With that, uh, I think we'll move to item D, which is uh, I want to welcome uh, Brian Florence, the Director of Inspectional Services. Do you want us to public comment? Oh, I'm sorry, thank you. Uh, were there any uh, comments from the committee on public comment. Kathy, go ahead. Sure. So, so I just want to thank everybody for their comments. It's, it's really, it's really, zoning is really difficult to understand. The language in the zoning ordinance. I mean, we're all trying to muddy our way through it. It's, the 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 language is sometimes difficult to understand. So I just want to acknowledge the comments that came in today, especially from uh, Ms. Hunt online. Uh, it, it's difficult to know what's going on and really what's happening. And unless you're working with it every moment of every day, like the staff do, um, they kind of understand the nuances perhaps of what some of the wording means. So one of the things that uh, could be considered is providing some kind of online tutorial for the public to understand certain aspects of zoning and what it means. Um, I've seen that in other localities. It's so easy to do videos and video education things online. I, I think it's something to think about. Um, I, I don't know what the other members of the committee think about that, but it, it's just an, for people who are truly interested in trying to influence how things happen in our communities and in our neighborhoods, it might be helpful to provide that kind of a, an educational tool online for people to better understand certain aspects of zoning that Im it impacts all of our daily lives, no question about that. So just something to think about. I'll just come, I think, I think it's a good idea, Kathy. Um, 
Um, if you have some suggestions as to other places that have done something like that, it might be worth looking at. And we could also add that second piece, which would be maybe a summary of what the enforcement, you know, uh, issues are that uh, Ms. Hunt mentioned, you know, what are citizens entitled to, what's the process, so someone could go to and look at that. So, thank you. Uh, Councilor Crow. Uh, I have to agree with Kathy there. I think we should tailor it probably to the most uh, problematic issues that residents run again against in zoning in their neighborhoods. Uh, this by right um, uh, zoning, or I, I thought it was called home occupancy, when you have a business in in your uh, in your in your neighborhood, um, and there are rules against how many cars are parked there, how many trailers are parked there, whether the whether materials, uh, they can't be on the outside, they can be seen, that they're working with. Um, this has become a real problem. I know we have a, a shortage of, uh, of uh, construction bays or, or, or contractor bays, um, but that doesn't mean we should have allow these kind of things in our neighborhoods. And I think I, I've been dealing with this for years myself, and uh, there doesn't seem to be any enforcement on this, or there, if there is, it's, uh, it's confusing as to what what is uh, we, what is allowed and what isn't, okay? And I think we need to be very clear on that. And I think uh, we ought to move to a higher enforcement level before this gets totally out of control. And it's uh, I, I can see it's done in Hyannis. It's done in parts of my neighborhood, all over the over the Cape. And uh, it's basically whatever you want to do, you can do until somebody catches you. And I think we ought to have a hotline. That, that and also enforcement officers that work on weekends for when these things happen, so you call them and they're there within minutes. Uh, I've had a neighbor that uh, puts a large amount of building supplies behind the house where it can't be seen, but you know, you walk by, you can see them, uh, but they're supposedly be hidden from anybody would go to look, and they so they obviously know that they're breaking the, uh, the rules of the road. So I think that's something that needs to be. Uh, the neighbors need to, to A, know what their rights are, B, have an have a immediate response, whether it's a weekend or not. And this goes with a number of different issues we have here, short-term rentals, all kinds of things. And I think we should start, before we um, go any further, we should uh, make, uh, make um, um, enforcement the, uh, the, the key to moving forward in any direction. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Crow. I was just going to comment. I think you know. Hopefully, one of I see one of our objectives here is to uh, uh, help understand what Mr. Florence's you know concerns are and how we might make his job easier. And some of the things that have been suggested here are ways that we can do that. And again, our goal is to provide the town council with suggestions that they ought to be looking at. If we can help provide him with solutions that make some of these issues, you know, um, solvable or, or, or um, easy, more easily addressed. That's, that's my goal here, I think, and as our committee. So, um, Councilor Bloom, thank you had a comment. I, I heard that Mr. Florence is asking for a couple of uh, people to help do this stuff. I, I think you might have asked for two. I, I think you, you should ask for four myself. Um, because, uh, you know, I don't know much about zoning and, and, and this stuff, you know, but, but I think we need to uh, operate from, from the, the point of view that a, a person's home is their, is their castle. And when people cause trouble, noise, early, too early in the day, throughout the day, at night, it's, to me, it's, it's more of, of a violation of, of pe people's rights to a peaceful life than, you know, traveling 65 miles an hour on, on, on Route 6, you know, and getting a ticket. Uh, if, if we don't consider when, when businesses move in or when, you know, if we don't consider that the, the neighbors around them and, and how that will impact them, we're really do, doing an injustice to uh, the people who have spent good money to um, pay rents, uh, mortgages, and, uh, and these kind of violations really, there's, there's just no, no good reason for them. Thank you, Councillor Bloom. Councillor Turkelson. 
Thank you, Chair Schulte. Um, I hear the frustration of the people in the audience, and I share your frustration. I have to actually left the town of Yarmouth because of such issues, and it was just intolerable. Um, so I, I don't want you to think what I'm going to say doesn't mean I don't care about what you're saying, because I, I do. I also know that people's exp lived experiences are so different. You know, what, what one person finds annoying, another person finds it's a big family, and that's my culture, or that's my heritage, and that's how I live. Um, I think the spectrum of how we live our lives and our experiences is very vast. You could go from the gentleman who has three trucks, three trailers, and they're spick and span, perfectly in a line, well-maintained, and that's tolerable, to the person who has on the other end, everything is up, you know, upended and disheveled. And we might tolerate the gentleman whose cars are in perfect alignment and perfectly clean, and then we might call on a neighbor whose things are all disheveled. So I think just to, we also need to be realistic that people live in a variety of ways that are acceptable to them. And it would be nice to think that we could call our neighbors and say, your light is blaring into my, my bedroom because I have that problem in, in my neighborhood, <laughs> Eric. Um, and, and some people just don't care. And we can't always regulate everything that happens in our neighborhoods. But is there a place where we can find consistent guidelines that are enforceable and legal and that we have the staff to do that so that we can improve the value of people's, as, as Charlie is saying, um, you know, people's investment in, in having that peaceful life um, and just recognizing that's a wide spectrum for a lot of people. So it is a challenge. So hopefully we can dig into some of those things. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from the committee? I will right, we'll go back to Mr. Florence, and, and before we get started, um, he and I spoke briefly before the meeting today. Um, I think his presentation is going to be a little longer than we might have thought originally, but we discussed and think this is an important enough topic that we're going to focus on this. So uh, one of the other agenda items was to kind of pick up on the form-based code. I think we're going to defer that right now just for people's expectations until the next meeting, because I think this is an important topic. We want to have him give it, have the opportunity to share his thoughts with us, and then also reopen it up for some questions. So just uh, appreciate that. Mr. Florence, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Schulte, members of the uh, committee. I appreciate your time today. Um, and I'd like to say for myself, um, I appreciate what you're doing. Uh, volunteering for municipalities is uh, it's, it's a commitment. Uh, I did it for 10 years on the zoning board here in Barnesville, and I was the chair for two of those years. And so I understand what it takes doing this stuff and the homework. And what we see here in front of us right now is not just what goes on. So uh, thank you. Um, I know that enforcement is not in your charge, but you folks have taken it up. And um, the committee's met six times so far, five of those, this topic of, of enforcement has come up. So uh, I asked Chairman Schulte if I could have a, 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 some time to, to go over the um, enforcement process in Barnstable and um, some of the nuances and the things that you folks may not have considered and, and people in the public may not have considered. So we've had two members of the public provide comment and some of those were actually allegations of improprieties to, of, the, of the town officials. Um, and resulting from that, we've had comments from the committee members as well as some comments of your own. I was going to try to take time and, and have videos of, of each one of them and then be able to respond for them, to them for you and for the public so that um, we could put everything in context, but it just got to be too much. As, I've, as you'll see, I'll be here for probably about an hour, maybe an hour and 15 minutes. Um, and if I had done that, it would have been several hours. So what I did is I broke it down into categories. Um, and what I'll do for you after this is I've, I've created an index and it's, uh, you'll see that zoning has eight times that they were zoning uh, not being enforced eight times. Uh, staff not enforcing during office hours a couple times. It was adding one of those today. Um, lack of enforceable regulations four times and so forth. Uh, we also talked about commercial businesses operating in residential zoning districts, overcrowding, discussions on business licenses and home occupations, insufficient data reporting in our permitting and compliance software, inspectional services not having enough help, and uh, there were five comments that I found were miscellaneous. Um, so I've created an index for those. I've also uh, put dates and timestamps on them so that you can uh, go back through your, your, the videos of your meetings and understand where I'm coming from uh, and, and what I'm talking about here. Um, I would like to say, uh, 
uh, member Ledeck and Councillor Turkelson gave you pretty much my entire presentation, so thank you. Have a nice night. <laughs> All right. Um, so what is enforcement? Uh, what is code enforcement? Code enforcement start with um, complaints to regulatory agencies, basically. Uh, a lot of times they're highly charged and emotional. Uh, people sometimes will sit on an issue that they've been having in their neighborhood for some time until they're ready to explode, and they call us up, and, and we get it both barrels. Um, a lot of times this originates from uh, neighborhood disputes with citizens trying to use the town as a weapon against other citizens. I'll tell you a quick story. Um, I, was, I was working in a, another town before this, and we had a big snowstorm. The plow trucks had been going all night long, or big piles of snow on either side of the street, and, and they were so tall that you couldn't see the mailboxes, and that's an important distinction. There were two neighbors who lived across the street from each other, neighbor one and neighbor two, and they were best of friends. Their kids went to schools together, played sports together. The two families went to Disney twice together, and one day after the snowstorm, or during the snowstorm, neighbor one was looking out the window, and he watched neighbor two back his car out, stop short, and then head south. About 10 o'clock, he went out to get his mail, and he looked down, and his mailbox was on the ground. So he said, that guy knocked my mailbox down. And so he waited for the neighbor to come home. The neighbor came home, and um, he said, hey, what are you going to do about my mailbox? And the neighbor said, I'm not going to do anything. I didn't knock your mailbox down. Look at my car. There's no damage. He said, I don't need to look at your car. I saw you do it. And so they parted ways, and they became bitter enemies. That lasted for over 16 years. I left. I don't know if they're friends yet again, but it lasted for 16 years. They would call my office and say, you need to go over and force against this guy. And you need to go see this. And, and they went on and on and on. The DPW knocked the mailbox over when they were plowing. And it came out about three months later, but still those folks are not, they, they're still angry with each other and they, they were still calling our office. So highly charged, highly emotional stuff. A lot of times it's original, uh, uh, neighborhood disputes, a lot of times there's a lack of knowledge or, or misperception uh, of what zoning even is. I, in preparation for this, and I didn't put it in my slides, but we, I had staff look at 381 zoning complaints that came in over the course of a year. I said, I want you to go through each one of them, and we're going to find out which ones are really zoning and which ones aren't. 56% of them were not zoning, but they come to us. We've got a zoning complaint. And so it's important to understand that a lot of times there's a lack of knowledge and a misperception about what these uh, violations are. I've heard it on this committee. I've heard it from members of the public complaining to the committee about zoning violations that aren't zoning violations. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. So that leads to speculation and assumption. And Council, uh, excuse me, <laughs> Member Ledeck very astutely pointed out that zoning is very complex. But you guys haven't been just talking about zoning. You've talked about regulatory stuff all the way from one end of the gamut to the other. So let's talk about that a little bit. All of these agencies that work in the town that have enforcement authorities are operating under a law, which is an enable, enabling legislation to allow them to have a code of regulations that they can enforce, whether it's a state code of regulations like 780 CMR, Massachusetts State Building Code, or Chapter 288, which is our local parking ordinance. 143, Mass General Law 143 enables the building code. So that's enabling legislation. So legislature said you can have a building code, and here's what it's going to be. Mass General Law 40A says you can create zoning ordinances for your, your town. And so that's the enabling legislation for our ordinance. Same thing with 111 for health, and Chapter 90 for motor vehicles, and 105 for the town clerk. Those are all mass general laws, and there's regulations promulgated under each one of them. And people think that because there's a motor vehicle in the yard, and I'm the zoning enforcement officer, I can go enforce under 40A to get that motor vehicle, unregistered motor vehicle, out of, the out of there, or cars out of the road. That's not true. It takes Chapter 90 and the authority under Chapter 90 to deal with a motor vehicle issue. I can't do it. I don't have authority to go onto somebody's property and say, get this unregistered vehicle out of here, or get that pile of junk that used to be a registered vehicle out of here. I can't say, get out of the road. I can't pull somebody over for speeding. That stuff all falls under Mass General Law Chapter 90, and you can't create a zoning ordinance for it. There's another issue for town officials that 
they think that if people think that the town is one agency. We're not. We're many agencies in one organization. I'll give you another quick story from Barnstable. And I'm going to use the same story a couple times about a, a, an addition close to a property line because this happened. Um, a guy goes out to a DPW crew that's cleaning a culvert, and he says, look next door. That guy's building a building, uh, an addition on his building too close to the property line. He doesn't have any permits. And the guy says, okay. And the man goes back to his house. I get a call six weeks later. He says, I told the town that they were building a, an addition too close to the property line without permits. Why haven't you guys done anything? He was telling a DPW worker on the street. He didn't call the building department. He didn't call. So we're not one agency. We're multiple agencies in one organization. Then there's a failure to read and understand our ordinances. I'll constantly get a, a call from somebody who says, look, at this section of the ordinance says you can't do that. But what they don't do is read to the bottom of the ordinance. Or they look and say, well, you can't have vehicles parked, but they don't, look, don't read to the bottom of the ordinance that says it's enforced by the police department for motor vehicles. So people fail to read. They fail to understand. And then finally, people don't understand the limits placed on um, on town officials, such as due process, probable cause, evidentiary requirements. Councilor Turkelson, if you had a, a, were building a deck without a permit in your backyard, and you invited Mr. Uh, Councilor Crow over to have tea one morning, but you had a big fence around your property, and you said, and you weren't, uh, you were building that deck without a permit, and he said, hey, did you get a permit for your deck? And you would say, no, uh, I'm not going, I'm not going to deal with those people. And so he goes back to his house, calls the building department, and we send somebody out. We take a look. There's a big fence around the building, around the property. We can't see a deck. Get out of the car. We listen. We can't hear hammers. We can't hear saws. We can't look over your fence. That's illegal. We can't do that. Um, so we go to uh, Councilor Crow and say, hey, can we see it from your deck? And we go look on his deck. Can't see anything. So the only option we have under the due process rules is to, Ms. Turkelson, can we see your back deck? And you say, no, get off my property. I only have one choice. That's to get off the property. I ask Councilor Crow, do you have a photograph of this deck? No, I just went there for tea. I can't even get a warrant now. So without evidence, without due process, probable cause, we have restrictions placed on us. Some people think it's a good thing. Some people think it's a bad thing. But it's a thing, and we have to be careful how we prosecute and how we build our cases. They have to be rock solid before we can prosecute them. Okay, so this perception that regulations are not being forced, enforced, staff work nine to five only, and the regulations are unenforceable. So a lack of knowledge provoking questions is understandable, but allegations of misfeasance, malfeasance, and nonfeasance, they don't play out in this scenario that we've been listening to for the last eight weeks or six weeks. We've received 652 complaints in the building division from uh, July 2023 to June of this year. 396 of those, or 60.73%, have been closed because the violation was abated or it was found to be um, not a violation. Again, the result is 60.73% resolved, 39.11% in process and still working. I would say your building division is doing pretty darn good. That includes all zoning and building code requests for enforcement this year. Inspectors are authorized by me to request overtime to work during evening or weekends on their cases, and they do so on an as-needed basis. So this idea that we don't work off hours is just not true. Building officials are on, on call 24-7, 365. We respond to police calls. We respond to fire calls at 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock, 6 a.m. It doesn't matter what time we have to go to work. We're expected to go to work. And if somebody comes to me and says, Brian, I can't, get, I can't catch these folks during the day. They're out. Their, their construction equipment, their landscape trucks are all out during the day. I need, I need overtime, a permission for overtime so I can come in at 5 o'clock in the morning so I can come in on the weekend, so I can come in at 9 o'clock at night. I authorize it every time. I've never denied it. Our manager expects us to authorize that. Regulations are enforceable as written. So I have a typo there. Regulations are not enforceable as written is the, is the uh, perception. The words are the words. 
I can enforce anything. I don't care what it is. You're going to hear about stretch code stuff on the town council coming up, and I don't care what the code is. You give me something, I'll enforce it. That's I put my hand up in the air, and I swore that I would do that, and we do that. Um, I think probably the more appropriate thing is that there's regulations that may be missing. There's things that people want enforced that aren't in our regulations. So if we don't enforce them, it's because it's not there. We can't make regulations up. We can't go out and create law out of whole cloth and tell people you can't do that when the code doesn't prohibit it. So the regulations are enf enforceable as they're written. Um, we are, and, and in Barnstable, we always try to evaluate our processes. Uh, I've seen several regulations changed. Um, it's because our planning department, they do a great job writing code. Um, and our, our town council, they, uh, they identify issues. This committee will uh, undoubtedly identify issues that need to be regulated. And us, as um, employees of the town, we identify things all the time. Uh, when we were um, doing the, um, sorry, I got distracted. When we were doing the uh, assess home, uh, home occupation regulations, the, the uh, town planner's office contact. What do you? What do we need? What are things that are important for enforcement? And that's one of the reasons that the council took that charge up was to deal with some enforcement issues, and it worked. It helped. A lack of knowledge is understandable. Regulations, as uh, Member Ledeck said, are complex, and people don't live that life. There are some exceptions on this committee um, to people that don't live that life. We have Council Ledeck or excuse me, Member Ledeck and Member Osman, Alsm yeah. um, both planners or, or zoning officials in their past, and um, that's fantastic, and I appreciate that. I like some of the comments they've, that I've heard from them. Most importantly has been Council President Penn. She has a wealth of knowledge. Um, her institutional knowledge is above reproach. I've had several conversations with her about um, the different zoning ordinances that have come into place, when they came in, why they came in, what was the public sentiment at the time, and, and how it's looked at now and how it was looked at then in terms of enforcement. Um, she, she's been very helpful to me. I will also say that she, before this committee sat for the first time, she had given me a list of questions and the intent, and she knew the answers to them, uh, but she gave me this list of questions so that you folks would have information from my perspective. Um, unfortunately, I didn't finish the, uh, my report back in time. I just, we've had a heck of a summer. Um, I started, I was, well, uh, you know, I was well on the way, but I didn't want to give an incomplete report. So um, we're going to touch on some of those questions tonight, if that's okay, because they're relevant, Mr. Chairman. Her first question was, what is required to enforce zoning in residential areas? I'm going to take residential areas out of that because I think it's important to understand where enforcement comes from. So we talked about um, Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 40A, Section 7. That's the enforcement section of that ordinance, and that reference is there for you if you want to look into it. Um, so I don't think there's anything that needs to be added to the ordinance, but it's important to understand how a request for zoning enforcement works and how the checks and balances that are in place for a person to seek redress if the zoning official gets it wrong. Look, I'm not perfect. I'm pretty darn good at what I do. I've been at it for 27 years. I've got, like I said, 10 years of experience on a zoning board. But hey, I make mistakes once in a while too. And I don't think anybody in this room can say that they don't. So what do you do when you've got that issue? Massachusetts General Law 48 Section 7 is entitled Enforcement of Zoning Regulations, Violations, Penalties, Legally Nonconforming Structures, Notice of Action, and importantly, jurisdiction of superior court. So the way that law works is the building commissioner is charged with, and I paraphrase this so there's a bunch of pieces missing. I was just trying to get to the points. Um, the building commissioner is in charge with enforcement of zoning ordinance. Uh, and I can't issue a permit or uh, a license without, for anything where the building structure or land which use would be in violation of the zoning ordinance or by law. Remember, this says use. That's important to, it's an important nuance. Then it goes on to say, if the officer is requested in writing to enforce such ordinances, declines to act, he shall notify in writing the party requesting such enforcement of any action refusal act to act and the reasons therefore within 14 days. Why is that there? It's there so that if the building commissioner gets something wrong in the enforcement of his 
duties, whether it's issuing a permit or a request for enforcement, the citizen has a right to an appeal. They can go to the ZBA and say, the Zoning Board of Appeals for the public, and say, listen, I think Brian got it wrong. We would like you to look at what the facts are and overturn what he's said. And they have the power to do that. If the Zoning Board of Appeals says, Brian, get out there and enforce that, we disagree with you. I have to do that. Likewise, if the Zoning Board of Appeals upholds my decision and the citizen still disagrees with me and disagrees with the Zoning Board of Appeals who upheld me, they have the right to go to Superior Court where the juris their jurisdiction is zoning. So there's processes in place when the building official gets it wrong. You've heard here in several of your meetings that, um, that nothing can be done. That's not true. There's absolutely something that can be done. Um, and I would challenge anybody, or, or I would recommend to anybody, that if they do have a problem with a building official and make, in making a zoning determination, that they follow the process of the law. You can't say, we want you to follow the law and enforce against this guy, and then say, but I'm not going to follow the law for the appellate process when I think you're wrong. I'm going to go around that. And you've seen that here on this committee meeting. Yes, ma'am. So, I'm just trying to get an idea of, uh, can you go back to that slide? Yeah, so what you're saying is, if you make a determination that you need to enforce said law or regulation, and I, as the person who complained, didn't agree with that, you will notify me on the day of that decision, and I have 14 days to appeal that. No, you have 30, so okay. here's... I guess I'm just trying to understand, based on some of the comments, what is the... I know that you're giving us the backstory. Like, what is... I'm very process-oriented. That's how I work. Like, what is the process? I, maybe you're going to get into that, and if so, please just tell me, and I'll, I'll be quiet. Like, what the process looks like for the resident, because one of the things um, Heather said was, well, what is the process, and how is that understood, and how could we maybe make that more clear? And I'm just trying to understand how this would impact me if I had made a complaint about my neighbor who was running a business and you said either there was an enforcement issue or no, this person's allowed to do what they're doing, like what that looks like. Yeah. Um, so the process is kind of the way it's laid out right there. Um, there's, if you file a complaint and I go out, let's say it takes me 10 days, so let's say it takes me 20 days to do the investigation. If at any point during that time I decide, no, this is not a zoning violation, I'm not going to enforce this, I'm required to write a letter and say we're not going to enforce that. And you write the letter to me who made the complaint? To the complainant. And yeah. that is mailed to me, emailed to me, both of those? Typically, I do both. Typically, I will send an email so you don't have to wait, and then I will send a certified mail or registered mail um, get to try to get your signature to recognize you received it. Okay, and if I don't agree, agree with what you've said, I mean, it seems you like... You can appeal that to the zoning board. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Attorney Connolly has a comment. Uh, sorry to butt in, um, Assistant Town Attorney Kate Connolly. I totally agree with what the building commissioner said, but I wanted to add um, for Councilor Turkelson, as part of the process, you can also appeal, or one can also appeal, if the building commissioner simply fails to act within 14 days. So once the 14 days is up, if you don't get a letter saying, I disagree with you, or I agree with you, and I'm going to take zoning enforcement action, you can still appeal. So if on the first of the month, or, or after the investigation is done, and, and uh, Director Florence has made his decision, if I don't receive the letter for some reason, and I call up Director Florence, and I say, I never heard from you, I have 14 days to appeal that. No. He has 14 days to take action, and if he does nothing, as soon as the 14 days is up, you have 30 days to appeal. As, okay. as Brian said, it's okay. a 30-day process for you to appeal, but you've got to give him the 14 days to investigate, decide if he's going to take action. So the only point I'm adding is that yeah. if the building inspector does nothing, you can still appeal. Okay, yeah. I'm just trying to get the timeline and the reality of how it all works because it, it sounds like a lot of stuff, so I appreciate that. Thank you. It is, and again, like Member Ledeck said, it, it's not easy. You think the zoning ordinance itself is, is difficult to read? Try reading 40A. It's, it's one run-on sentence for 
10 chapters. Um, okay. So, but here's the real issue. And again, um, uh, Councillor Turkelson, Member Ledeck, pointed, both of you have pointed this out. The real issue with enforcement is education. Um, there's an inaccurate perception that zoning is not being enforced. It is. We do enforce. We're very diligent about it. Uh, we had two counselors who educated themselves. They came to our, uh, our office and they sat down and they l watched the cradle to grave process in our code enforcement program and how it works. They, they were told by neighbors that they're not doing anything. We've, fi we've filed complaints 14 times and they've never done anything. And when the counselors came to us, they sat down and looked and saw that we had 155 enforcement actions in there and that the matter had actually been resolved for several weeks. And so um, I invite you, this committee, to come look at our code compliance program and the way it works. Um, you're going to hear a little bit about, more about that at the end, but um, we're really good at it. We have a good program. It's a robust program. Despite what you've been hearing, um, we do a pretty darn good job. Um, so there's a systematic misunderstanding of the in the community of what zoning is, and some of our citizens incorrectly associate all neighborhood problems with zoning. So council president brought up a follow-up question to her first one. I'll go back. The first question was... Am I going right now? Yeah. I can't see the green. Oh, there it is. What is required to enforce zoning in residential areas? Then she followed up specifically the long-time accumulation of trash, junk, unregistered vehicles, boats, and the expansion of commercial uses in residential neighborhoods. Now, again, Council, Council President Penn knew the answer to this question, but she wanted it out there in the public. So this is an, ex an excellent example of the misunderstanding of zoning. Two-thirds of the items in that list are not zoning. And yet you've heard about them here at this committee meetings, at these committee meetings, saying zoning isn't being enforced. Trash, junk, unregistered vehicles, unregistered boats are not zoning. They don't have anything to do with zoning. So what is zoning? I don't, I'm not gonna read the whole paragraph there, but zoning defined is the regulation of land use. So if you get a piece of land and you put a hospital on it, that's a hospital use or a business use. You put an automotive shop on it, that's an automotive use. You put a, 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 a convenience store on it, it's a convenience store use, right? Zoning is not the regulation of behavior. A messy yard, overgrown vegetation, cars, unregistered, uh, uh, derelict cars, unregistered vehicles, decrepit houses, those are behavioral issues. They're a failure to maintain. They're a failure to be a good property owner and a good neighbor, but they're not zoning issues. There's myriad reasons for that. Some of those reasons are people are just scofflaws. They don't care. They're just gonna, they don't care about the value of their property or their neighbor's property. That's, that's not as frequent as you might think. Hoarding. Hoarding is a mental health issue. It's a very unfortunate and sad situation for people. But a lot of these cases that we look at are, are hoarding issues. They don't want to get rid of that piece of lumber that they've been saving for 30 years, even though half of it's rotted. Um, and then probably the biggest and most, um, the most prolific one is finances. Um, people can't afford to deal with the problem. Um, so you get... You know, somebody will put a pile of junk in the backyard. It's 25 bucks, 50 bucks. I'll take care of it next week. And they put another one next to it. Well, it'll be 100 bucks. I can take care of that later. Next thing you know, they've got 40 piles of garbage out there for $100 a piece, and it's $4,000, $5,000 problem. And now it's too big for them to handle. It's like letting your car go. You get a ding on one corner, and then you don't fix it, and you get a ding on another one. Next thing you know, you're looking at your car like it's a piece of junk. In all of the enforcement actions that we do, the last thing we have to think of is court. We have to build a case, we have to have probable cause, we have to have evidence, and we have to make sure that our case is gonna be a case that a judge can look at and say, yes, we agree with the town, and we're gonna help them enforce it. Bringing behavioral issues to court under a zoning pretense, I wouldn't make it through opening arguments. We'd be done. It's not, with, not zoning. So, what is the path for unregistered vehicles and boats and trailers? And I'm, I'm going to even add in their parking and roadways as a related issue because you've heard about that even tonight. We hear about it all the time. Unregistered motor vehicles, boats, trailers, and parking and roadways are all civil issues regulated by the police department and when it comes to boats and boat trailers by the Marine Environmental Affairs. 
The code reference for you is chapter 228 in our ordinance. Those codes are promulgated under chapter 90, like we talked about earlier, Mass General Law, chapter 90, which authorizes the community to, uh, to write those ordinances. And then if you look in the Town of Barnstable Charter, located in the, under the code, Part 1, General Ordinance, this is really long, sorry, <laughs> Chapter 1, General Provisions, Article 1, Non-Conforming, uh, uh, Non-Criminal non Enforcement of Violations, Section 1 and 2A, Parenthetical 1 and 6. What that's going to tell you is um, the police department is able to enforce unregistered vehicles, parking in roadways, things like that. Not your building inspector. I don't have that authority. Um, I'm going to jump into one of those uh, miscellaneous items that I said we wouldn't touch on except for the one, and this is it. Um, Mass General Law Chapter 40, Section 21D, fines. Last, the last meeting I saw, uh, Member Ledeck had asked about fines. She had several really good questions. One, how are they assessed? Well, it depends. Um, Mass General Law 143, the building code, um, there's a provision in there for fines, but the way the courts have adjudicated it, it's it's for the state to issue. Um, so what we, and it's a thousand dollar a day fine and, and so forth. Um, I don't know any building official in the Commonwealth that's been successful with that. Um, doesn't mean they haven't, and, and I just don't know of it, but I don't need it from the building inspector's perspective. We have an, another process. We, we can get an injunction through superior court. It's our, our legal department is very helpful there in that regard. If we need an injunction, uh, we can get a temporary injunction right away, and if it looks like we need a permanent injunction, they have, there's a process for that as well. So we don't assess fines for building codes, but zoning we might. Um, so how is a zoning, uh, uh, a zoning violation assessed? It usually depends on the situation. So if we, we always try to seek voluntary compliance first. You know, there's a saying that, you know, when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Well, we don't want to go in and start slamming our, our citizens. We want to approach this with a professional and reasonable approach. So the way we do it is we try to seek voluntary compliance. The first thing we do is go in and say, hey, you really shouldn't be doing that. We need you to stop. Can you stop? And if they stop, we're done. If they don't stop, We'll send a notice of violation to them. We'll give them a certain amount of time to, to cease and desist. If they don't cease and desist after that, then we can start the fining process. Um, Mr. Schwab has a neighbor here that uh, we have fined twice. Um, and then the next question you asked was, are they ever collected? We've, don't quote me on this, but I think the last time I saw our report from our code compliance manager, we had collected over $16,000 in citations. So yes, we collect our fines. And the one I've referenced on Melbourne, we collected two fines. Um, this is a sad story that we'll get to in a moment. Um, so how are they structured? They're structured in that ordinance. So if you look under that, that long section that I, I wrote there, uh, I pulled out of the ordinance, that, that's where they are if you, that the, the um, the rules for Mass General Law 21D it says the town has to have a structure for them. So if you look in that article, um, Article 1, non-criminal citations, uh, you'll see the, the structure for that. Uh, zoning is $100. That's all we can charge for a zoning violation. The general law allows us to charge up to $300. Um, I'm going to be going to the town council at some point here in the near future asking for them to give me a progressive fining structure that goes from warning... 50, 100 to 300. So counselors on the board, on the committee here, you'll see that um, at some point. Excuse me for just one moment, if I could ask you, yeah. is that per day or just per violation? Each, so it could be multiple citations mm -hmm. on a property and each day is a separate offense. Okay. That's the way the, ordinance, the general law is written, okay? Fines aren't a magic bullet. Fines are, they're problematic in their own right, but that's another topic for another story. I'm sure the town council will get to hear about that. I know that the two counselors that came to talk to us heard about it. Um, so who gets fined? Um, again, like I said before, it depends on the ordinance, um, and it depends on the general law and how that's structured. Uh, but generally, we will find somebody, if, if it's a finable offense in the ordinance and the general law all allow for it, we'll find somebody, we'll find somebody who's um, just blatantly noncompliant. And what opportunities do you have to make corrective action? So the opportunities there, I think the town is limited. The general law is a, is a law by the state law. Um, I think that the opportunities we have to make correction, corrective actions here is, like I said, uh, we can work on the fine structure and the fining amount. 
So um, I think that's about it for that. Um, unless you have any other questions. All right, so what uh, zoning is not continued. We talked, yes, sir. So how would this differ from being a civil violation versus if it was a zoning issue in terms of correcting that um, behavior? In um, so in terms of what was previously thought of having on unregistered vehicles being a zoning issue, it's not that. It's a civil, uh, it's a civil infraction. How would that, how, how, what's the difference in those consequences? Okay, so if you, if you, um, if you see the, on this uh, presentation here, this is the path to enforcement for vehicles, right? Yes. So it's the same process. Mass General Law Chapter 48, 40, 20, 21D, the police can use those. Um, citations, the building official can use those citations, the health inspector can use those, you know, and conservation, MEA, we all, we can all use those same. There's other processes we can use, that's not the only tool in our toolbox. We have the ability to go to court, um, and there's other, other things as well. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay, good. Um, Brian, right. a quick yes. question for you. Uh, understand under some of these items and the civil issues, so you say for vehicles, it may be police department enforces that. Is there any other precedent or way that other communities, obviously the police have, in their opinion, more important issues, they're unable to enforce some of these issues. Is there any vehicle, no pun intended, for another body being established or assigned that task, whether it be you know, the enforcement agency or can you set up another group to enforce some of these issues? Have you seen other towns do that? Uh, yeah, I'll defer to legal on that, but I would highly recommend against it. Here's why. So in order for me to um, bring something to court, I have to be able to identify someone. I don't have access to the Registry of Motor Vehicles computer system. I'm not allowed to have access. So I can't call the, the, the court or call the RMV and say, can you give me access? I need to follow up on this VIN number and, and registration. And I, it's not my expertise. The same thing with boats. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't asking about you, yeah, Brian, no. or your group. I'm just saying, if there, is there another group that, and, and Kate, if you want to weigh in on this, is it possible or are there any other towns that have established a group to enforce some of these things might be outside of the zoning enforcement but could look at things like this? The answer is yes, and I worked in one that had it, and, and it was a miserable failure. It doesn't work for, for the reasons I stated, and that's why I was, that's why I was saying that, but go ahead. Um, yes, Mr. Chairman, in answer to your question, as Brian said, the non-criminal disposition statute is Chapter 40, Section 21D, and municipalities like we have done, have to adopt specific local ordinances that can be more stringent than the state. Under 4021D, there are three things that you have to put in your ordinance, and it can apply, as Brian already said, it can apply to MEA, conservation, zoning, police department, for under Chapter 90 for uh, vehicles. But the three things are, you've got to identify which topics, like I just mentioned, who the enforcing authority is, so it can be, if it's a conservation violation, it's usually gonna be the conservation agent or administrator. Zoning, it's gonna be the zoning enforcement officer. Um, something involving the police or MEA it can be one of their officers. And then the third thing is, as Brian mentioned, the fine has to be no more than, or the statute actually says um, not to exceed $300. More than half the municipalities in the state, and I've represented about a third of them, often make the mistake of saying up to three, they copy the exact language of the statute and they say up to $300. No, the ordinance itself has to say the exact amount and it just can't be more than 300, but it's 300 per violation per day. So the fines can add up quickly. And a lot of towns do, as Brian suggested, he's gonna ask the town council to do, which is they stagger the fines. First violation's 100, second's 200, third is 300. But right now you can't go above that. The legislature did have a petition before it a few years ago to raise it to 500, but that lost, so it's still 300. Can you that, explain what MEA stands for? Marine and Environmental Affairs. It's one of our town departments. Thank you. Thank you. Well, so, one other question. Oh, sure. I, I just want to finish that. So, yes, the answer to your question is yes, the town can asset, assign somebody else to do that. But it's like assigning your dentist to be your heart doctor. Why would you do that, right? So, okay. All right, thank you. And one of the questions, just to go back before I forget about it, I understand your comments about the deck situation when you said there may be a fence around, you can't peer over the fence. Explain to me how our assessors, if they're going out, they're able to look at, you know, what's been added, what's done. You know, how are they able to have that ability and you're not? 
you know, um, I, I can't tell the assessor, you can't come in and look and see if I finish my basement, or maybe you, maybe they can. But I mean, things like that, decks, uh, outer structures and stuff like that, our assessors are able to go out and look at that. How does that differ from what, you know, you do on the zoning enforcement? Couple things on that. Do you want to jump in on something? Um, you can do it. Okay. So they, uh, remember we said we, we have a general law and a regulation, general law. They operate under a completely different general law. They operate under a completely different um, regulation. They're not going to know whether or not they're in, somebody's in violation of having, having a deck constructed. They're just going to see that there's a deck constructed and they're going to tax you on it. Sometimes they do know, like if they go into, like assessors rarely go into houses that I see. I've had the assessor come by. I invited them in my house. And they're like, no, I don't. Um, but but um, let's say the assessor, we, I've had instances where the assessors have found a, a, an illegal apartment. Well, they've let us know. Um, but they have different rules and different regulations for being able to go on property. I'm an enforcement officer. They're not an enforcement officer. So I, for this, just like the police, I have to have probable cause. I have to have evidence. I have to have a reason to be there or I'm violating their civil rights. Yes, ma'am. I do have a question about that. Um, so if, because I think one of my earlier questions actually this kind of touches on it, is the sense like you said we are many agencies under one umbrella, the town. So like if, if the gentleman comes up to DPW and says, do you know that that guy over there is putting a fence or whatever, something that shouldn't be, and DPW is in their silo, you're in your silo, and we have this other silo. We have all these silos all over the town, and it's like there's no communication between those. So I guess my question is, when the assessors come in and they find an illegal apartment in there, they're not contacting you? I mean, I would think for, first of all, they're gonna want to assess that property, and we should know if that property is permitted, installed correctly, to code for safety, I mean, I guess I'm curious, do, do they actually come to you and say, do you know there's an illegal apartment in that basement? Or do they just live in their silo and they just carry on their day? Yeah, in my example to Chairman Schulte a moment ago, I said that I have had instances where if they've seen an illegal apartment, they'll let me know. They don't, they don't necessarily know if there's a violation. They don't, they don't, they're not standing there when we issue a building permit. They don't come over to the building department and look in our files to see if there's a building permit, any active construction going on when they go out there, or, or looking at the history of construction before they walk out there. I, I don't know what they do, and I don't want to have to answer for them, but they do sometimes tell us when they see something that, that they think is an issue. But they, it would have to be a pretty blatant issue because they don't, they don't know what the building code is. They don't even, they've never read it in most cases. They don't know what the zoning ordinance is. They've never read it in most cases. So how would they know? They know what, how to tax something. They know what, it, what you're going to charge for a bedroom and a bathroom and a deck and a shed. But they don't know if that shed had a permit. That's my only answer. You'd have to ask. I would defer to them, but. Well, no, I mean, I know that because this happened to my house. My house was designed as a one-story home, and the building department did not talk with the assessing department. And my house, because it looked like a two-story home, was assessed for a two-story home, and I was never aware of that because I didn't look at the property card. The problem is, is there isn't there isn't like the siloing of what happens in our town, is kind of a perfect example of why silos don't work. It's like you know the building department and the assessing department. I can't even believe that that there isn't more of a conversation between those because I mean, I would think that we'd want for the safety of our residents if someone is actually in a property and there might be something that was done illegally that we're protecting the safety of our citizens that they should know this is not a, this is an illegal property because the building department has given no permits for a second you know a basement dwelling you know but that's a whole topic of another we, time we issued 11,000 permits last year so to sit down with the assessors and talk about 11,000 permits and then the 11,000 permits the year before and the year before and the 600 complaints this year and 600 complaints last year and the ones before, there'd be no time to do anything else but talk. But I think this gets to the point of what some people are saying is that maybe there's not enough help to get the jobs done. And, and that might be, this might be an instance. I mean, you know, every time a patient comes to me, I have to verify their insurance. It's not like I don't have time. I have to make the time so that I know what your insurance is, so I know what I have to charge you, what I'm allowed to do with you legally, what I need to do to get paid. 
and I know that's an entrepreneurial sense and the town operates on a different function of that, but the point being is the assessors should have access maybe to the building department and see what's been permitted or what's not because seriously, it, it cost me a lot of money when the town of Barnstable messed that up. But on the same hand, above and beyond money is if there's something going on in a property because we are required to reassess our properties and something is not safe and they're just assuming maybe it is safe, it seems kind of like we're setting ourselves up for a lot of basement dwellings that maybe are not permitted and maybe dangerous or contributing to the problems of overcrowding that our residents have come here to speak of. So I don't want to sound like I'm, you know, it's not any one person, it's the siloing of how we do this process, you know, and, and maybe not having enough people to be looking into how those things intersect. Uh, so. Councilor Turkelson, I don't know how you could possibly have enough people. So what you're suggesting then is that the building department should know and the assessors should know everything about those two, but then you've got the health department, so they should know about everything those two are doing, and then the, the, uh, the tax office should know everything that everybody's knowing, that everybody knows, the DPW, and you've got 28 agencies that should know what everybody's doing. It's not, I, don't, it's not, I don't think it's possible. I don't think you could have a city of people big enough to do that. Brian, I think if the building department issues a permit for a single-story home, and I, the assessors has the right to come in my home and change what's in, change the assessing of what's inside my home by coming in there, that they should know what's legally been permitted to be in there. I mean, I don't know, I, I never really looked at the permits building my house, but I'm sure it was permitted for a one-story home. So if you show up at my house and I have a two-story home, which is why the town gave me the problem that it gave me, because I could have illegally put a second story in my house because I could have been a nefarious person who did that. I had to give the town access to come into my house to prove that. If they had just taken the building department permit that said single story, three bedroom, two bathroom home, and when they showed up in my house looked like a two story home, trust me, I would have taken the day off to let them come into my house. But they could have seen right there that something didn't add up. I don't know why, that's not like a huge deal, that's just like, Three bedrooms, two bathrooms. Wow, it looks like she has a two-story home. That wasn't what it was permitted for. And we're required by law to give the building permit that we receive, that we issue every time to the assessor's office. I don't know what happened. I, and I'm sorry for what happened there. I, I really am. I, I understand your, your concern with the communication. Um, I, don't, I don't know how to explain what happened. I do know this. When I issue a permit under Mass General Law, Chapter 143, I have to give a copy of that to the assessor's office. That's done every month. Okay, I think Mr. Crow, yes, yeah, Councilor Crow. Yeah, Brian, I, I understand what you're going through here, and, and, and I, this is um, informative, okay, but what's zoning and what's not, uh, and I don't know if this is the, uh, what I'm asking is, is the Barnstable Resource Line still open? The what? The Barnstable Resource Phone Line. I don't even know what that is. Well, it's a phone line that we were set up uh, a couple years ago. Um, it has to do with calling in I think Lynn answers it now, um, but it used to be uh, Robin Anderson. But it was a line that you'd call and say, there's a problem over here. And that person, when we set that up, I think it, was, it had to do with the SDR regulations, not you know five or six years ago. And it was set up for citizens to call in, and that person would be the, would be the, um, the quarterback. Would say this is an issue for housing. I mean, for for the police, this is an issue for this, and that person would get back to you within 24 hours. That's the way it was set up, uh, to direct you to the right person that could take care of that problem right away. I know. What you're okay, talking and this now. would save yeah. you a lot of problems and everybody else. But I think if it's not still in, in in line, I think the one of the things we should probably, as counselors, talk to the town is about setting that up, to to relieve you of the problem you have here with all these people calling you about things that are not zoning. I understand that. But there are problems, okay, and they need to be fixed, and they need to be also um, um, investigated at the time that they're happening. Okay, and that's why I was talking about, you know, uh, you know, people working on weekends. Okay, so I think that's something that maybe we should talk about as a council. I don't know if this committee has any strength in that, but, um, there are a lot of problems. People are complaining about it. The town doesn't seem to be able to get a hold of these because of the people not knowing who to get a hold of. But I think we should go back to that and have that person say, hey, this is for Brian. I'm calling Brian. Brian, you get back to that guy in 24 hours and tell him what you're going to do about it. Point of order, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, 
Attorney Connolly, hold on one second. IT just got in touch with me. Yes. That citizen resource line is still operative, and the number is 508 862 4925. It is answered, and people are directed to the correct person regarding their complaint. So the line is still up and it's still running by somebody answering it hmm. no matter what time. Thank you. Attorney Connolly? Yes, yes, Mr. Chair, thank you. If I may, through you to the two previous speakers, Brian did start his presentation by saying that this is zoning enforcement is not part of the charge of this committee, but he's answering questions because it's come up at at least five of the previous meetings. We're also now talking about the building code and getting really far afield yeah. of what the committee's supposed to be doing. So sorry to jump in, but I just had to remind us of that again. No. And I'm happy to talk with some of you. I have further answers to some of the questions that are being asked, but they're not part of the charge okay. of this committee. Thank, thank you. I was going to say, I was going to ask um, uh, the committee members just if we can hold the questions for the most part, let Brian finish his presentation. Um, and uh, just as a point, I did also speak with President Penn uh, at one point, and she, she felt comfortable with us discussing some of these issues on zoning that they were related. So if we needed to go back at some point, we can talk to the council, but understand your comments as well. So with that. Just a quick statement on a question. Uh, I'm under the understanding that is part of zoning and zoning enforcement is part of the same thing, in my opinion. It all comes under the same rubric. So if you don't have enforcement, you don't have zoning. So I think that ought to be discussed whether that's part of our, our um, our, our charge here or not. I think we'll, we'll we take that up later on if we need to go back and expand the charge officially, but I think President Penn agreed that it was within the, the purview of this committee. So, But for now, we'll focus on Brian finishing up his presentation and then answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and if I could, just so the question doesn't hang out there lingering, um, thank you, Councilor Crow. When you said that Lynn answers the phone now, and then I realize what you're talking about. She does. She does quarterback that. I get, um, I get zoning, building code, health questions all the time. And we do respond immediately. If, if she says, I got this email, I will cut and paste that email address instantly. I won't even go to another topic. And I put it in and I respond to that individual. Um, the, the idea that we don't respond quickly is it's just not accurate. We do. We, we work really hard. And I invite you to come to our office and sit down in our training room and look at our code compliance program. You'll see how fast we address these issues. We don't mess around. We're good at this. Okay, Brian, I, I don't think I said that, that you don't respond. I, I said that um, uh, that is the correct line I've had all along. I think it was set up for a 24-hour response. Not, not, I'm not talking in general for any department. So um, I will just say that that, that resource is available. We should, as a town, make that well known to our citizens and it would save you and the town and all the citizens a lot of problems in the future. So thank you. Just yeah, go ahead I, and your presentation. I just didn't know the name of it, so I apologize for that. Yeah, that's but no problem. we do use it. All right, um, so a couple of notes on unregistered vehicles. There's a, uh, a misperception that it's illegal to store unregistered vehicles on your pro property. That's not true. Chapter 288 allows for that. It says that they have to be screened, though. And the police department, if they get a call on it, they go out and they enforce that, that, uh, that issue. They say that it, you have to screen it from view. Um, vehicles die every day. You know, these things get piled in people's yards, and, and it, you know, just keeping up with it, we, re we are a... Um, complaint-based organization, the whole town is. So if something shows up, let, let the police know if you see an unregistered vehicle. I would say this in your recommendations, though. Be sensitive about that, because there are some instances where an unregistered vehicle is not a bad thing. You get somebody who's trying to build a muscle car or an antique car. You see people that, are, that have uh, motor homes, very nice motor homes. They bring in the yard, they, but they don't want to spend insurance at 500 bucks a month or 600 bucks or whatever it is nowadays. I don't even know. It's very expensive, though, uh, to register for 12 months a year when it's sitting you know, dormant for nine. Um, and likewise with boats. So if you're going to make recommendations to the, to the town, I first recommend that you talk to the police department and see what they need for tools and then be cognizant of, of the fact that there are some reasons why an unregistered vehicle might be uh, okay. Brian, uh, just, just a clarification. Sure. I think there already is a rule that you can have one unregistered vehicle on property, not more than one. Yeah, that has to be so screened. Therefore, yeah, okay, That's the, yeah. I'm saying vehicles, plural, but talking about the town. Um, and again, I, it's not my area of expertise. I'm not the, the enforcement officer for Chapter 288. 
Um, again, and also vehicles parked in roadways, again, that's a police matter. I don't regulate things in a roadway. Um, for, in order for me to take charge of, a, of, a, of an enforcement matter, I have to come off the roadway and step over somebody's property line onto their property before I can have anything to do with it. And if it's an unregistered vehicle, I still can't have anything to do with it. All right. Business licenses and home occupations. This is a big one. Um, I don't know if I can play this. Uh, I was going to play a, a video of the last uh, one of the meetings and, um, and just show some of the, the reason why I say education is the biggest problem. Zoning enforcement isn't the biggest problem. It's education of what zoning is. So, but I'll, I'll skip over that. So the next question Council President Penn asked me was, what's required to enforce a business license, i.e., assure that the business owner is operating within their license and not engaged in uses that are not licensed? Mr. Schwab, oh, when you say home occupation, that just doesn't come into view. Thank you. Home occupied by businesses, or do you mean, what exactly do you mean by that? Uh, specifically, uh, the mic. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, specifically, home occupied businesses, home occupation, uh, my understanding is, which Jim can clarify, is that uh, you can go down to the clerk and pull a DBA for $15, right? You, you just file online and get a certificate. It says what you're doing. You're a handyman, you're a carpet cleaner, whatever. And they just prove it. Uh, that certificate, all that's supposed to let you do is open a checking account so that you can cash checks in the name of handyman DBA. Uh, but that record goes to uh, Mr. Florence's office uh, for approval. Uh, and, and my understanding is that there are procedures to consider that DBA request and decide whether or not it's suitable for the area. So if, you, for example, if you're up, you file for, uh, to open a pottery shop, and you want to put in a high, you know, a furnace in your backyard, you know, that that might require a little more scrutiny. Uh, and so there are sort of loosely worded provisions for some of these businesses to go to planning. Uh, I don't know how often Mr. Robichaud sees them. I think it's an infrequent occurrence. But there needs to be more than an approval for a checking account. Someone has to look at this request to do business in the town of Barnstable and consider what the potential impact might be on the residential neighborhood. So there was a zoning change allowing um, home occupations in areas outside of uh, Hyannis that was passed. So it's within your seven year time frame. Um, but you should look at the flow of those, the business formations. And just look at the flow to see if you like it. Uh, and I would ask Mr. Florence to uh, detail it for you uh, because it seems to be a little bit under the radar, the way it is set up right now. It would seem to me that if you're going to use an address for that DBA, that has to be, in a, for whatever business you're going to, it has to be allowed in the zone you're, you're planning on doing it from the start. That would be logical, yeah. Because the DBA is, I'm going to do business out of this location. Okay, if it's not, if it's a residential neighborhood that doesn't allow uh, business to be run in those those neighborhoods, it should be should be disallowed. The, the regs for the DBA, as written, are for administrative offices or administrative control. There's no discussion about trucks, furnaces, paint storage, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's just not in the regs. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Okay, we'll definitely. Uh, the I'm sure that's going to be an area we're going to talk about. There's no control for incorporations, so there's no interface with the state. So if, if you form an LLC, then you can start operating without any declaration, right? So the, at the minimum, we should consider uh, some reporting from the state on new business formations, LLC, Inc., whatever. So we're at least aware of what corporations are operating in town. And one reason for that is uh, I believe that has tax implications. So, uh, you know, if you're 
bringing equipment into the town, operating an uh, incorporated business, then it may be possible uh, to tax those assets in some fashion. And we're not even looking for them. We're not even aware of them the way it's set up. Okay, great, thank you. Again, as I said, this is one of the most misunderstood things in, in this community. It's actually been mind-boggling as your code enforcement officer to watch this happen. So, um, and, and this, this is not accusatory to anybody there. I just wanted that video there to show just the, the um, vastness of the misunderstanding. There was really nothing said there was, um, nothing said there um, was completely accurate. So a business license and home occupation registration are two completely separate things. A business license, or what's, what it's really called on the law, is a certificate. They're not regulated by the zoning. They're not regulated by the inspectional services. They're regulated by the town clerk under that lane, right? Mass General Law, Chapter 110, Section 5. It says any person conducting business under any title, replace title with name, any name, other than the real name of the person conducting the business shall file in the office of the clerk. That law was established to stop the snake oil salesman from coming through town, poisoning a bunch of people and taking off and nobody knows who he is. It's simply a mechanism for identifying people. It's not there for, uh, to obtain a checkbook. It's, there, it's not there for taxes. It's there very specifically to identify the person operating a business. So if a person operates a business under any name other than their own or the corporate name of their entity, which is registered with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, they have to register with the town clerk. In Barnstable, uh, Mr. Schwab was 100% correct. I, as the zoning enforcement officer, as a courtesy, review all business licenses that come through town. I do that to ensure that when the clerk issues a business certificate, that the, the citizen isn't going to go open a business in their whatever district it is. It doesn't just have to be in a residential district, in any district. I do it to make sure that they don't get a knock on the door from me later saying, you've opened a business uh, automotive shop in a place where you can't do it. Pack up your tools and sorry you spent all that money, but you've got to go. That's why we do that. We do it as a courtesy. I'm not required to, and the clerk doesn't have to let me do it, but we do it as a courtesy for her and for our citizens so they don't get hurt. It's a cooperative effort. It's been very successful. Um, and to be clear, as the zoning enforcement officer, I review every single business license that comes through this town, every one of them. I do them on Fridays with Maggie Flynn. We sit down and we do that. Just a note on business licenses. Uh, at your 20, August 23rd meeting, a member was sent, trying to explain them and conflated business licenses and home occupations and stated that corporations and LLCs are basically a free-for-all. They don't have to declare anything. They can do it anywhere unabated in Barnstable. That's, that is not accurate. Um, it's true that if you have an LLC registered with the state or uh, in corporation, um, if they're going to do Brian's Deck Company, LLC, and they operate as Brian's Decks, and omit the LLC, then they have to file with, to let the clerk know that I'm operating, doing business as something different than my LLC would say. But if I operate as an LLC, uh, doing business as an L Brian's Dex LLC, I don't have to register with the clerk under a, under a certificate or a DBA because I'm operating as the name I'm, in, I'm required to, just like the law said. Um, but this is where home occupations come into play, and I, and I, I think that this exchange here will, uh, or this transition will help a lot. All right, so home occupations, that's, that's the town ordinance, chapter 24046, the zoning ordinance. It's not a business license. The rules and regulations for a home occupation are very clear, very concise. It has to look like a home. It, you, can't, you can only occupy 400 square feet. You can't have more than one employee. You can't have more than one vehicle, less than one ton DOT rated, and a trailer with, less than, with more than four, uh, two axles or four tires, I, I believe it says. Those are required for any business in any home in any district, including our residential districts. It doesn't just 
limit it to residential districts. If you're in the industrial district and, you have a, and you're living in your home and you want to operate a landscape company, you have to file for home occupation registration. In reviewing, uh, so again, it's any home, any district. It includes sole proprietorships, independents, LLCs, incorporations, DBAs, any business. Nobody's, nobody's exempt. It's not a free-for-all anywhere. Council, uh, uh, in, in reviewing the, the language that council president submitted, I, I would say that we could change some of the words in that sentence to what is required to enforce a home occupation registration, assure that business owners operating under their home occupation rules and regulations are not engaged in uses that are not registered. I'm going to ask a rhetorical question or a trick question. When did business uh, operations in residential districts become illegal in Barnstable? The fact is, they have never been illegal. Not once. Barnstable was incorporated in, 19, in 1639, and for 385 years, it has never been illegal to operate a business in the residential districts. In fact, I would say that a vast majority of the businesses in, in Barnstable are located in the residential districts. We have roughly 500, uh, five to 600 storefronts and business operations. We have thousands of home occupations. So, so in, in 1929, the first legislative action under the zoning law, when the state wrote the zoning law and said, you can create zoning, the first legislative action in Barnstable was to distinguish between non-residential zoning districts and residential residence zoning districts. And the first paragraph read, I'll just paraphrase, no parcel of land having any resident in, in any residence district shall hereafter be used in any business or industry for any purpose except for a residence. Pretty straightforward, right? But like I said earlier, you have to read the, the regulation from the top to the bottom. It goes on to say, a permit may be issued in any residence district for the purpose of any business or industry if the selectmen shall after a public hearing so order. So, they've always been allowed. It's never, this is not a new concept in Barnstable or many of our towns around us. So business was allowed, but it had to undergo a review, pro a review process. process. <laughs> Sorry, I have braces now and I, I can't speak sometimes. Um, so in 1929, the population of Barnstable was 7,000. Selectmen could have easily listened to the, uh, the uh, home occupation, or excuse me, the residence business petitions at that time. By 56, the population went between 10 and 13,000. Barnstable also underwent a zoning change, and so the selectmen at the time said, we're going to get this out of our area. It's getting too busy for us to do um, our regular business and deal with these, so they gave it to the Zoning Board of Appeals. And they said that the Zoning Board of Appeals could allow uh, in, uh, business and residence districts, as, and, and so they made a rule for special permits. Back then, special permits were not what they are today. You could walk into the, the department, file an application, pay your 20, 30 bucks, sit down, have a public hearing, and, and you'd be okay. You'd have, a, you'd have your special permit or your permit would be denied. And then you could do the court thing and all that stuff that we talked about earlier. Nowadays, it's $600 to file an application for a special permit. And you have to have a survey done. And you have surveys be, you know, on a half acre lot, it's about $4,000. So you're five grand right there. And the zoning ordinances, as Member Ledeck said, are so complicated, you need a lawyer to come and present your case. And that's going to cost you 2,500 to five grand. So if somebody wants to open a, 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 a craft business to make Christmas wreaths and make 1,500 bucks a year, they have to spend $10,000 to go to the zoning board. They would have to spend $10,000 or thereabouts to get a special permit. So in 56, it was easy to do. It was reasonable to do. I shouldn't say easy to do. It was reasonable to do. It was still given scrutiny, and it should have been. In 1989, Barnstable adopted a charter, and between 1990 and 20, uh, 2000, the population of Barnstable uh, exploded. It went up to 40 to 45,000 people. It became untenable for the ZBA to hear of that number of cases for new businesses. So in 95, the then town council adopted home occupation registration, which is a lesser standard than a, a special permit. That ordinance is very similar to the ordinance in its current form. So it's been here since 1995. And it authorized the building commissioner to do a review of zoning before they issued a home occupation registration. And that's what we did. 
and that's what we do. In 2022, as you've heard, the council eliminated the requirement for a special permit in the RC1 and, R and RF zoning districts due to the reality that most of our businesses are in residence districts and operated out of our out of homes in all of our districts. Um, but half the town was penalized at the time, or a little, uh, little less than half, little more than half the town was penalized. The RF and RC1 basically took up um, I want to say from old stage west. And so people over there, if you wanted to have a wreath business, you'd pay $10,000. People across the street wanted to have the same wreath business could do it as of right, just by applying for a home occupation registration. So they were penalized for living in just two of the 14 zoning districts. So again, the current home occupation requirements under section 24046 of the zoning ordinance, the format has been around since 1989. There have been some modifications to it. And while no ordinance is perfect, Barnstable's ordinance, in my opinion, as an enforcement officer and as a guy who has to review these things, it's perfectly reasonable, sensible, and enforceable the way it's written. Despite what you've heard, I review each and every home occupation registration personally. It comes to me, it comes in my email, I, get a, I have to uh, sit down with Maggie at our weekly uh, meeting, she's our site plan review coordinator, and we review every single one. I denied one today. I do it all the time. It's not that there's any, it's not that there's no oversight, there's plenty of oversight here. Um, Maggie and I, with the help of IT, we created an online application that has tracking abilities that didn't exist before I got here, and before I got here, the um, interim building commissioner had allowed staff to uh, do these reviews. I saw that, and I, I immediately dis determined that was wrong, it shouldn't be done like that, so I took it back over the way it was supposed to be, the way Tom Perry, our previous commissioner, did, and I made those corrections and, and, and conducted a review myself. We created an online application with tracking abilities, as I said, we strictly review every home occupation, um, and then we deny home occupations that don't belong in residential districts. If you come to me and want to put an asphalt plant on Old Stage Road, it's a no. It's the way it is. Um, so here are the numbers that you haven't been told, or you've been told that don't exist. From 623 to 724, the number of business license applications was 395. The number of home occupation applications was 175 for a total of 500, or 507. <laughs> um, uh, and, and I reviewed every one of them. I do them on Fridays. I do them diligently. I never miss a day. All right. There are more businesses in Barnstable's residential districts, as I said, than all of the storefronts in our zoning districts combined. There are literally thousands. They're on almost every street in town. The vast majority are never heard from or never heard about because our, we have decent, responsible, law-abiding taxpayers who don't bother anyone and they operate businesses out of their home. You have one that sits on your DS. You heard in one of your meetings that Councilor Mendez operates a home occupation. Guess what? I've never gotten a complaint about Councilor Mendez's home occupation. We have an amazing population of business owners in our town, and we shouldn't punish them for a few bad apples. We can talk about how to address the bad apples, but let's not damage the people that are good law-abiding taxpayers. All right. So the home occupations that are the cause of complaints successful businesses, people that start a business and they start it with a, a pickup truck and a trailer and the next thing you know they're doing great, they're making money and now they get another trailer, they get another pickup truck and like Mr. Schwab said, the piece of people behind them have two sets right now, um, we're dealing with that. Anyway, uh, the, biggest in, the second biggest industry on Cape Cod is the service industry and contractors are one of the largest segments of that industry. Barnstable has effectively outlawed being a contractor. Let me repeat that. We have effectively outlawed being a contractor in this town. Past legislators have unintentionally pushed contractors into the residential districts through zoning, and you heard Council President talk about that at your first meeting when she said that the industrial district was set aside. There are nowhere in our zoning districts where one can have a contractor's yard except for the industrial district and maybe some areas in the B. Um, there's no land available in the in industrial district for purchase or lease that's suitable for a co small contractor. It's either owned by the town uh, uh, for, for protecting water as a wellhead, or it's owned by uh, private industry. It's not for sale. Inspection service has literally had to drive some of our business taxpayers out of the town of Barnstable because of the ordinance. 
Mr. Um, Council Mendez uh, yeah, could tell you about a situation near him where a contractor, exactly like I'm talking about, started out with a pickup truck and a, a wood chipper. He started a tree business. He got so successful that he cleared about 3,000 square feet of his lot and parked 12 ton, 12, 10 ton trucks in there. And the neighbors went out of their mind. I get it, I understand, I don't blame them. Um, it wasn't good, so we started enforcement action. We, we talked to the gentleman, we gave him a ticket for 800 bucks for each charge. Like I said before, he had eight vehicles at the time, each one was $100, so we hit him with a fine for $800. He came and he paid us, so what should I do? We told him, you need to find some place to be. He said, can I have a little time? We said, sure, you can have 14 days, let us know. 14 days comes by and he didn't come in and see us. He didn't, and, uh, and so he didn't move his vehicles. We hit him with another $800 ticket. He came in the next day, he said, that he, after his mail, and said, here's the $800. Is this all I have to do? I can give you $800 and I can keep my stuff there? He's willing to pay $800 a day because it, he could charge $3,500 to take a tree down. That's three days worth of parking and he's doing 10 times that in a day. So. Successful businesses are the ones that we usually have a problem with, um, and I don't, I don't have the answer, but we should either look at trying to find a way to accommodate them or just plan to kick them all out of town because I don't know, I don't know, I'm not a policy maker, I'm just the enforcement officer. But those are the ones, it's, it's successful businesses are generally the ones that are the issue. Okay, so Councilor, Council President Penn asked me, do our ordinances need to be changed so that enforcement is easy for the town to impose and easy for residents, homes, and business owners to understand and comply? And, and, and comply? Yes and no. Obviously, there's always, you know, we can always do a better job with our ordinance and, and write things to be more clear. I think Ms. Hunt was right today. I think that some of that stuff should be incorporated into our, into our ordinance to make things a little clearer. Um, I think that the, if you read the general law, like I said earlier, it's very confusing to read, and our ordinance is generally silent on it. There's some communication in there about it, but it's, it's kind of what I said today. You file, uh, if you get, you, you know, you get a complaint, you got a couple days, and then uh, either something is done or something isn't, right? So yes and no. Unregistered vehicles, I don't know if we should do something about that. Not that I'm aware of. It's not anything I'm supposed to be enforcing. It's chapter 228. I recommend you talk to the police department before you start doing anything because they are the enforcement authority. They may have some input for you that, that you, you or I aren't thinking about. Same thing with unregistered boats. I don't know. I don't know what should be done to the ordinance to fix that, um, but MEA should be consulted to see if they've got some things that would be helpful for them um, and, uh, and for the, the citizens that they know about. Business licenses, remember, that's not a home occupation. Business licenses, that's a state statute. I don't think you can do anything about it, but if, if you do, I don't think you need to. Um, the, the, the process works pretty good. Um, but I defer to the town clerk on whether or not she needs any help with it. Um, home occupations, there's gonna be some regulatory changes proposed to the town council, but they're funded. Remember the first time I was here, Mr. Chairman, I said, recommend anything you want, but if you do, there has to be a funding mechanism. You can't tell us to go out, I mean, an enforcement agent, go out and make sure that person mows their lawn. You get there and the person's indigent, they can't mow their lawn, they can't even afford to, to get their lawn mower fixed, and so something's gotta happen to get that done, right? So what is that? A guy with a pickup truck, maybe working at inspectional services, work a pickup truck and a trailer and a mower on it, and then we get a court order to go mow the lawn? That all costs money, That it all takes funding. So. Uh, is there something that can be done? I think so, and we're gonna, you'll see in a moment, we've got some plans for that. I don't know what you folks can recommend, but um, I'll show you what we're doing. So we haven't been idle. Uh, we, as, I said, as I said before, we're continually evaluate, evaluating our processes and working toward continued improvements in our processes and the things that we do. We've created a code compliance procedures manual. It's not, it's not available yet, but we're, we expect to be this fall or early winter, talking to the town council about um, the next bullet item. Uh, so we created a, a code compliance manual and a training manual so that um, our, our enforcement officers are trained to all do the same thing. Uh, we're working towards some internal procedures and then um, procedural modifications that'll be presented to the manager this fall. Uh, what does that mean? It's a bunch of words, but in effect, 
Um, what it boils down to is we're talking about things just like we just we just mentioned. So we can't we can't go put a lien on a property and 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 do work on a property without a court order and and funding. So it, what's the problem? Money's the answer. If the town council wants to give us a bunch of money to go do these things, those are things we could do. Right now, there is none. We don't have money to go abate and correct things ourselves. Uh, there's some policy changes that are needed in the administrative code that'll go before town council. Um, basically, what we're trying to do is code compliance got orphaned, and it got orphaned into the building division. And we literally do code compliance for the entire town. When a MEA ticket comes in, conservation ticket comes in, health ticket, building department, zoning, all those tickets go to um, our code compliance manager, and she, she literally enforces those tickets for the whole town. It doesn't belong in the building division. The building division is footing the bill for the whole town. So in order to take care of that, we have to do, we have to get to ask the town council to move that code compliance division out of the building division and give it uh, its own division. We're planning to do that. We want it to, we want the town council to provide some resources for that, some people. So Councillor Bloom, when you're talking about, you know, how many people do we need? That answer isn't out yet. I don't know. It's just going to depend on what the expectations are from the town council and what we're expected to do for work. So when I know that, I'll have more answers to that. Considering changing the home occupation, there's problems with it, though. Um, one of the things I was thinking of is doing it as a licensing program rather than a regist home registration. Um, the, I like the license program because you can you have something to revoke. Um, that they are never going to want to let go of, um, but by the same token, a registration I don't need. I don't need any authorization. I don't. So to to lose a license, there has to be a hearing and that sort of thing. For to lose a registration, I can just take it under Mass General Law Chapter 40A and say, you're done. So those are the kind of things we're looking at um, for inspectional services. Let's talk about the software. I've heard so much about the software over the course of these five those five meetings. I came to Barnstable in 2017. The permitting program was view permit. It was all but abandoned. The only thing our staff were and the public were using view permit for was for windows, siding, and roofs. That was it. Everything else came in paper. We had stacks of paper from here to the moon. And there was, there was no enforcement component to the software. There was. They called it enforcement module, but... Um, it was basically a name and address and, and a comments box. So it really didn't have any of the functionality that we have now. Um, there was no enforcement, organized enforcement program in, in the town. Um, the people, our, our enforcement officers working their tails off and they tried really hard. We had a CRM database, which was nice. IT created that one. Um, and it was, it was okay, but it wasn't functional uh, the way we needed it to be. Um, so enforcement was haphazard because of that. Case tracking and data collection was non-existent. View permit, the company view permit was acquired by OpenGov in 2018. Remember, I got here in 2017. In 2018, I started to complain to the vendor uh, through IT that the enforcement module was ineffective and that we needed something better. To their credit, the, the vendor listened to me and they, they got together with our staff and we created a, an enforcement module through the vendor. Um, they asked us everything we needed, and we, we told them, and we showed them how we wanted it to read, what we wanted it to look like. So the Barnstable's building division staff helped design alpha and beta test those programs, and now the vendor sells that program all over the country, all over the world. I, I think it's in Canada, too. The vendor recently... So, Talking about our abilities and the, and the work that we do and how good your building department and your health department, your inspectional services department is, the vendor recently asked if they could showcase Barnstable as a best-in-class example uh, in OpenGov's user conference in, uh, called Transform next month in Texas. They're going to be here in the New England in April, and they've asked us to speak, and they want us to show the rest of the country what it's, what it's like to have a good code compliance program. So you've asked me, Mr. Chairman, about you know, the, uh, the, the request from the public about certain cri reporting criteria. We have an out-of-the-box solution. We didn't create this. The town IT department didn't write this. Um, it does not have the reporting capability the way that uh, Mr. Schwab and Ms. Pettinger asked. 
We can't give you the day close resolution or category in a report to give them so they can build a table. Um, it's not something IT can create. I talked to IT about this because I knew that you were going to ask the question, and they said no. Um, but that doesn't mean that the information isn't in our system. The software, the intent of the software is to be used by, by staff as end users. It's not meant to disseminate to the public so that they can critique the staff's work. It's got a very specific role. And so we categorize the information in our system the way we want it to, not the way the public wants us to, or Mr. Schwab or Mrs. Pettinger wants it. We categorize it by priority. And Mrs. Pettinger hit on that when she talked about that. She says there is some categorization, but it's just by priority. Well, that's what we need. We don't need any other type of categorization. Priority one is confirmed or likely, or likely a life safety, health, or environmental hazard. Priority two, the potential or capable to escalate to a life safety, health, or environmental hazard. And priority three, unless otherwise required by law, a non-safety, health, or environmental related complaint. The date of closure and resolution. The software is a tracking and communication tool designed for internal town officials. To find the date of closure and the reason for it, you have to be an end user. You have to be able to go in our system and read it and understand what the inspector saw and did and how it worked. You have to go in and read the case file. Not all information in our files is open to public scrutiny. We have client attorney, attorney privilege information. We have ongoing investigation information. And we have sensitive information like people's social security numbers or date of births and checking numbers. We don't just let that out and available for anybody to see. But anybody that's ever complained to us since I've been here has been informed by me or by our staff that there's a process for obtaining public available information on a complaint. Councillor Turkelson has benefited from that in the past. She asked me what's going on. I was able to provide her all of the public available information on a property she was investigating or looking into. We, we, our, our citizens are instructed to inform after 21 days. That's the, the time period under Mass General Law Chapter 21D. It's a 21-day ticketing scheme. So after 21 days, if they don't pay it, we can go to, take them to court. So that's the longest, really, period of time, and we, we use that as our standard for when you can call and ask for what's going on with that complaint I submitted. Um, they can call any time they like after 21 days, and we'll provide them a report. What we're not going to do is assign a staff member to 200 pages of complaints and provide that data, the, the closure, uh, resolution, and category to Mr. Schwab and Ms. Pittenger because they want that data. We don't have the staffing or the time or the money for something like that. It would take a full-time staff probably a year to get through 200 pages, and it, I don't even know if that's enough time. So we're not going to do that. If there's very specific information about a... Um, about a case, happy to do it. You know, um, and, and uh, as I said, Councilor uh, um, Turkelson has benefited from it. She understands that all you, if you have a case that's on your mind and you want to know something about it, we can provide it. It's public information. If you want us to go through 200 pages, there's going to be a, an assessment, and that's the bottom line. So um, we can do it, but you're going to hire a full-time staff to do it. All right. Took a long time. I'm sorry it was so much. I'm sorry it was so much time. But I went through those nine categories. I tried to hit on everything, and I hope I did okay for you. Happy to answer any questions. I meant to tell you there's a page number for each one, and if you wrote the page number, we could go back through. But, uh, yeah, Mr. Chairman, I'm at your service. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, I'm sure that was somewhat <laughs> cathartic for you as well. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I know that... Um, yeah, obviously, you know, I, I know personally I'm not as been close to the, some of the enforcement issues, um, but but I learned a lot about that too, what falls within zoning, what doesn't. Um, you know, there's probably still a lot of follow-up questions. Um, we could have a whole discussion on how to use the information and what to obtain and stuff separately. But, again, I appreciate that. I think that was a, a great overview for all of us. Uh, I guess I will start and reopen public comment, ask everybody to... Please be respectful. We're running pretty late tonight, so if you have a, a, a comment, if you could keep it as brief as possible, and then we'll go to the committee members. 
consistent recommendations. First of all, I really want to thank Mr. Florence for coming here and preparing this presentation. I'm sorry that I had to come here five times and complain in order to get a slide talking about what might happen this year. Okay? So that, that's harsh. I'm sorry. But these are issues that have been kicking around the town for some time now. Okay? And you can shoot the messenger. Okay, and say, oh, it's only two people, but it's more than two people. Okay, so let's be realistic about that. So we want to work with you if you want us. If you want to do it on your own, that's fine. But I would ask that you put some dates on this slide and commit to delivering what you're promising because this is all we're asking for. You've heard us, you've listened, and we appreciate that. I had just pause for one second. I just um, um, I just want to stress that I think we want to move forward with the committee. I appreciate there's been a lot of confusion, misunderstanding between the parties, and um, so I just ask everybody respectful. Let's let's try and move forward, work together, you know, going forward. I, I you know, I apologize. I probably should have asked Mr. Florence earlier to eliminate references to individual. A uh, little, uh, little harsh. But I but, but I, I apologize. Okay. That was that was my error. I should have done that. So with that said. Okay. Please go ahead and finish okay. and we'll go ahead. I've got a property behind me. It's been going on for eight years. I've got a property in front of me. It's been going on for four years. Okay. This is not a one-time issue. Okay. Eight years and four years. Okay. I've gotten two letters. The last one was a couple years ago. Okay. So I love all this talk about compliance and follow-up. I wanted to follow up with the ZBA and I was told I'd missed my deadline. You know, that wasn't allowed to complain ever again. I have that in writing, okay? So let's focus on the public and what their needs are and try to help them, okay? If there are procedures that we should be aware of as residents, publish them somewhere, right? Put them up online so people understand what they can do to protect their properties from degradation, because that's what's really happening. These properties are being degraded by ruthless operators, and I agree with you. Many of them are successful, and that's part of the problem. I've got a guy behind me, has two Range Rovers and a 32-foot boat, right? And he told me he couldn't afford parking for his equipment. I said, you know, dude, you got two beautiful Range Rovers and a gorgeous 32-foot boat because you're not paying for parking, right? You're using your residential property, you're extracting value from your residential property, operating a landscaping business, right? And you say you can't afford parking. Well, you know, I don't accept that as an excuse. And I, yes, I appreciate the fact that he's successful, but you, when, you're, when you're successful in business, you have to accept the cost of that business, right? When you're bootstrapping in the neighborhood, no one cares about one truck. Right? I got a guy right next to me, just set up his son with a pickup truck and a little trailer for a lawnmower. I have never, ever once said a word about him and his stupid lawn blower that he walks around with all the time. Because we want him to be successful. He's the, you know, went to Barnesville High School, you know, has a business. We want him to operate in our business successfully, I mean, in our neighborhood successfully. So again, Let's depersonalize this discussion, okay? You know, the, my town councilor asked me to go to the building inspector and ask for the data that we analyzed. It was not an affront. It was not an invasion of the building inspector's privacy. My town councilor made it very clear to me that I wasn't to put through a records request, that I should only be giving that data that, you know, that Mr. Florence willingly provided. And so we looked at it. You know, could we have done more? Could the data have been better? Sure. You know, Natalie and I are both consultants. Our job is to go in and look at the data and say, oh, I want to sell you this add-on. You know, it's like, you know, we both sold reporting professionally. We both know how to look at a database and say, hey, you need better reporting, right? 
There's nothing wrong with that. You know, we're not insulting the building commissioner or his work, but you need better reporting. You know, you need a dashboard where you look at and say, oh, look, look at how hard Brian's working. All these new business applications come in. These are the complaints that came in. These are the complaints that weren't zoning related. These are the ones that are zoning related, and this is how quickly we resolve them. Isn't Brian doing a great job, right? There's nothing wrong with that kind of reporting. That's standard reporting. KPI reporting is standard in the industry, and we're an industry. I mean, Barstable is a big industry, right? I mean, they should have reporting. There's nothing wrong with that, so bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Schwab. Any other public comment? I will open it up to the committee members. Councilor Crow. Um, I don't want to get into that uh, the, the back and forth there so much, but I have one statement that I think it also applies here, is that the people who are home occupations with these businesses, they're growing, they're doing well, fine. But they're extracting value out of the property. But not only that, they're extracting value out of your neighbor's property. This is the problem I have with short-term rentals and everything else, is that these are, these are residential neighborhoods where somebody else is running a business. Now, if you're a successful business, then you have to find a place to park your vehicles, okay? You can't just say, we, there's no place to park. Well, maybe no place to park in Barnstable, but if you check uh, towns next door, this kind of thing, I, I know it's very tight finding contractor base. I know that. But there seems to be, Barnstable is almost completely built out, but there are other, other things where, you know, if you have to commute 20 minutes to get your truck, that's not really a, a tragedy to me. I grew up in New, uh, New York, uh, Connecticut metro area. Everybody commuted at least an hour and a half both ways, uh, each way. Um, so not enforcing it because there's not, uh, they're not, finding places to do their business or park their, their businesses without doing it in, their, in somebody's neighborhood, I don't think is a complete excuse here. I think it seems to be something that should be forced to do. Brian, you might have a different opinion. Mr. Thank Barnes, you, Mr. Ahead. Chairman. Um, I, I reject this it, sense that we're not, it's not being enforced. We do. That's what I've been trying to tell you all along. We do enforce. Um, this notion that we're not, I just showed you there were 600 en enforcement requests in, in, in the last year and 61% of them are done. The others are in process. We're, we're doing it. We understand what is being said about the vehicles and the contractors. I just explained to the committee that we kicked the guy out of town. We sent him over to Yarmouth because we enforced the ordinance. And, and I apologize, Mr. Uh, uh, Chairman, if I used Mr. Schwab's name. He had been using my name for the past five meetings. I thought that that was the way the committee was going. So if I had known, I definitely would not have done that. I have no ill will towards Mr. Schwab. Um, we have worked on issues before. We've agreed on some things. We haven't done others. And um, I, I'm glad he's happy that well, we, we've got something coming forward in the future. Appreciate that. Yes, sir. Councilor Turkelson. Um, Director Florence, you know, I run a business. I have a very as I keep saying, I'm a very process-oriented person because it's the only way to keep track of all of the data, do it right, do it well, do it efficiently, get paid for the job. Um, so I guess my question for you, and I know part of my frustration is not understanding the process when I first came on board, and I appreciate all the time you take, and I have to say for everybody up here that hasn't read what Brian will produce for you if you do have a question, you know, it's... It's very detail-oriented, and I appreciate that as a person who likes details. I guess I'm wondering, I have a standardized process that I do with my patients. I intake them a certain way. I explain the same thing. I provide them in writing so that they understand. It's, it's uniform, and it's a process. So I'm just wondering, to Heather, um, Heather's point, when you take a complaint in, it seems like what would be useful, I don't know if you do this, is like an auto-generated message. This is what to expect. This is what we do. This is the time we have to do it. This is when you can contact us. This is what we will give you. We won't give you. This is what's within our preview, not within our preview. I mean, I'm sure that you probably rewrite the same thing over and over. Like, I have a letter for collecting money. I have a letter for cancellation policy. 
everything is standardized because I don't have time to write it a hundred different ways and I know each case has its own details and, and you do an amazing job in that. But I'm just wondering if the point to the resident is when I call and I make a complaint, you're in taking my information if I give it to you because there's plenty of people who won't give you that information. They want to be anonymous. But those people that want to know what the process is and what the follow-up is, do you have a standardized process that you hand to them so that they really know what to expect so that you can do your job and they're not calling you every three days saying, what the heck, what the heck, what the heck, like I do. Thank you, that's a great question, I appreciate it. Um, and it's timely as well. Um, as I said earlier, we are working on a code compliance manual. I showed it to you when you came and, and we're uh, looking at our, our, our code compliance program. Um, we got a code compliance manual we're working on. That's gonna be published online. It will tell you and our inspectors and the elected officials, it will tell the citizens. They'll be able to go right online, look at our code compliance manual, they'll know what to expect, when to expect it, and and you as town councilors will have the ability to hold us accountable for it. And um, how, how big will this manual be? How many pages do you think it'll be? Our manual's probably 50 pages, but that process you're talking about is front end loaded. It's in the front. Okay, because I'm you know, just... The follow you know, the bouncing ball, call yeah, comes in. I'm just thinking like you need to make it, as to Heather's point, as clear and as concise and as simple as possible because most people don't have the tenacity or the brain capacity to read 50 pages, there must be, we do this, this is what to expect. We do. I mean, I would think in a one page primer, you should be able to explain to a resident, and then if not, maybe it's hyperlinked to where else they could read more, or that when somebody um, comes in and you take a complaint, and it's not just go read the manual, maybe you actually give them the link to the manual in an email or in a, any written communication that you're giving to somebody. You know, you, the town assumes that everybody can understand the website. I, I don't find our website particularly easy to use. Laser fish and all that stuff, it, it's a lot. And if you have somebody who's elderly and they don't have a computer or they're not computer savvy, it's like we have to make the information super simple, super accessible. I think that's um, something that our residents deserve because your job as demonstrated today is very complicated. There's no way people are going to follow 99% of what you said, but they need to know like the general nuggets of, of what you would want the resident to know to make your life easier. So we're not keep, we're not calling you over and over, but the residents know, okay, 21 days, I'm going to mark it on my calendar. I think it's been about three weeks. I could reach out to, to Robin and follow up on that case. I think, I think that's, a fair ask of a resident to feel like their um, information has been taken in and their concerns will be addressed in a manner that's timely based on general laws and whatever other things, because it sounds like there is a roadmap. We just need to know what that map is. So. I hear Ms. Hunt, I hear you. Um, and I can create a brochure, a companion brochure to go with the code compliance manual or a flow chart or something like that. We can do something like that. That's not, that's not a, a heavy ask. Um, so yeah, no problem. Make it bilingual? Yes, sir. Yeah. It'd be very, very helpful. Okay. Councillor Bloom. Thank you for the presentation. Is is there any way I can, or is, is, is this presentation in your website uh, on the department, or is there any way I can get this presentation with the active links and everything? We're going to give that to Mr. Schulte for the committee. Great. Uh, I'm sorry, Chairman Schulte, sorry, sir. Um, give Bob is fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I noted from the meetings that he's asked for all of the documents to be consolidated and, and put into a repository for the committee. I will do that. I can tell you there's only one link that's active on that. Um, uh, I can try to make them active before I turn the, the slideshow over if you want. But I, yeah. you'll, have the, you'll have the slideshow, whether the links are live or not. I'll, I'll, yeah. Depends on we'll have a hard copy that Cynthia always includes those in our minutes, so we'll have that as well and do some additional follow-up. I will say I've spent two weeks on this, and I haven't gotten a lot of my other work done, so it's <laughs> I've got to get to work. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, just, just thoughts that I have. I mean, clearly I think 
education is one of the key things that's come out of this discussion that, you know, we need to do a better job educating both the public and, and, and folks as to what is zoning, what's not. Um, I think comments they made by Councilor Ledeck and a uh, member of the public, Heather Hunt, uh, I think, you know, whether it be a primer, establishing what C Councilor Turkelson was just talking about, you know, whether it's a primer on the website or uh, a, a brochure that gives a high level so people understand, I, I think those, those are key things. The other thing I thought that was very important when you were going through the summary of things you're working on, Brian, is I think the thought that the compliance piece being broken out separately. And that's where I think if we can do that, that's where, you know, adding the people Charlie was talking about, whether it's two, four, or whatever, I know that requires budgets from the town and things, but I, I think that's a really important process. Part of this process um, is somehow formalizing the compliance group section or whatever so that you aren't always getting the phone call or your people and stuff. So uh, we understand you've got a lot on your plate and what has to be done, and clearly you need more people. I mean, I had another follow-up question. I'm not going to get into it now, but I'm just curious, and we'll talk about it more under the form-based code. Obviously, through that process now, it's all kind of come down to you as the, you know, for to make the decision. We've taken a lot of that away from the planning department. I'd love to ask you more about that as to how that's working since you've had several projects, but we can talk about that another day. But again, those are just my general thoughts. Again, as we're going through here, there'll be recommendations that we make to the council, hopefully things that will make it better for the public and make your job and your group, your jobs, uh, your group's job easier through some of those recommendations. And I was very happy to see some of those things that are being worked on currently by your group that I wasn't aware of until today. Yeah, the co Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, our code compliance manual we've been working on for a couple of years. Uh, it's, it's not a new revelation to us. We, I, when I came to Barnstable, I identified within the first month that code compliance was the biggest issue facing inspectional services. By far, it was disorganized. There was no software for it. There was no tracking abilities. I've systematically been dealing with that inch by inch the whole way. It doesn't happen overnight, um, but when it's done, it'll be... Um, Best in class. I, I'll have a follow-up comment. Um, uh, careful what you uh, what you wish for. Um, I, I would be interested in taking you up on an invitation to come down and see, you know, your compliance, whatever control center, whatever you want to call it. Huh? I don't know if anybody else is interested in doing that. Um, so uh, I guess I would be curious. Maybe we can set that up either directly through you or through Jim or somehow doing that. Um, yeah. <laughs> So Director Florence, you mentioned earlier about your uh, code compliance program. Is that something we could just drop by your office at any time to go through it, or not really? It's like I said, it's a work in progress. We're we're it's going to take the um, administrative code action first. It's going to take the town council action to get that division separated out and into a separate division, and then funding it and having having that resource. The code compliance manual is almost done. It just needs some editing and, and cleanup, but. Uh, um, once we do that and we have our code compliance program legitimized, then, yeah, all of it's available. I mean, it's just a, it's a public document, yeah. But, Seth, are you asking about going to um, D Director Florence's office to actually see how they enter a complaint in and how that goes from start to finish? Yeah, like a simple run through to yeah, like a can, good example yeah, of that? you can do that. Yeah, that's, that's what I offered earlier. I, the whole committee can come at once if they like and come through and, and go come to our training room. Mm -hmm. I will show you cradle to grave how a complaint comes in what we do what the action is taken I can give you a list of complaints and you can pick it or you can let me cherry pick some big ones for you and I'd be happy to go through them the only thing I ask as administrator though that if we have a quorum of this committee going to Brian's office in one day I need to know about that because I have to post it okay. that you're visiting the office so I need to know who's going when so that we don't have an open meeting violation okay. sure um, Brian, maybe I can ask you if you can go work to Cynthia, maybe to come up with a few dates over the next, you know, 30 days that we might be able to circulate and see if we can come up with a date that those that are interested might be able to attend. Sure. Uh, I will go one step further and ask you if there is one or two members of the public that would be interested in seeing that as well, would you have any issue with that? I'm happy to talk to legal about it. Okay. I, mean, I just want to make sure that I'm not doing anything wrong. Okay. I'm not sure that they would or wouldn't. Uh, but I suspect there might be one or two. <laughs> yeah, I don't have a problem with that. If it's okay, I don't have an issue. Okay, thank you. Kathy. Yeah, so, so thank you for the presentation. Um, 
I, I appreciate the time that it takes to put all of this down into something that is coherent. It's very complicated, as I have mentioned several times, and, and I'm grateful for you preparing it in such a way that we all can use this to help us sort of construct in our minds what our recommendations can be to the town council. So, so thank you very much for that. Um, I, it, what an emotionally charged issue. Um, even, even in the presentation, it's easy to sort of get yourself all worked up about uh, one, one item that's being discussed because you remember something that happened you know, in your neighborhood or down your street. Um, and, and I appreciate your sort of even keeled demeanor. I think it means a lot to us trying to learn from you about all the details of, of the work that you do. And so thank you very much for that. Um, I understand this issue of being legally defensible when you're out there working on your cases too. So, so I understand the importance of that. I think we, we, we I just wanna echo a comment that Councillor Mendez had at the last meeting and it is that we really don't want to squash the entrepreneurial spirit out there in our community. You know, we're talking about enforcement actions, sort of a negative thing. I mean, you know, we have a very powerful entrepreneurial community out there, and we really want to make sure that any of the recommendations that we put forward support that. Just as you mentioned in your presentation, I think it's really important for us to keep that in mind. There are bad apples, and those are the ones that we need to focus on in trying to make our recommendations. So I just want to encourage everybody to keep that in the back of our minds because it's really the backbone of our communities and, and we want to continue with that. Councillor Turkelson, you're a great example of that with your own business here and, and Councillor Mendez the same way and others. Um, I think we need to use technology to our advantage. A lot of the things that we're talking about and, and Mr. Schwab, you brought this up um, earlier when you had the co your colleague here looking at all of the data. We need to use technology to our advantage. And what that can do is it can increase transparency so that the public knows more about what it is that's going on with a particular case. But it also can provide us with enough data so that we can look at the data and know, wow, you guys have done so much work over the last 12 months. I didn't even know that. And, and I admit, I didn't even know that. So I, I'm, I'm kind of blown away by it because it really is a lot. Um, but I also think that that's information that needs to be out there for the general public to know so that they can feel even better about what town government is doing for them. I think we, we, need to, we need to work on increasing transparency and using technology to our advantage can help us with that. And education, same sort of thing. We can use technology to our advantage to come up with some kind of training mechanism to teach people more about what is zoning enforcement and what is not. And even when, even when the call, I, I just remember being in, uh, uh, living in other localities you report your complaint online, you get a tracking number, and you can go look it up anytime you want after that complaint is put in there and know what the status of that is. And it provides, everything is tied to that complaint number that's generated by technology, right, in a database, and you can sort through that throughout the entire life cycle of the complaint and pull reports so that you know what it is that's going on. So. I think we need to use technology to our advantage. I think that there's a lot of technologies out there that can be used as a go-between between what it is that you need and what the general public needs to see and, and then what even a committee like this would need to see to better understand the details of the great work that you all are doing. So I just wanted to share that briefly and thanks again for coming today. I really, I learned a lot and I'm grateful for all the detail, thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, Kathy. Any other comments? I just want okay. to say thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Ken. John? I also want to say thank you. I know a lot more today than I did before about what's your responsibilities in your department versus others. I really think maybe one of the things we should recommend out of this committee is the, is the wide um, dispersal, dispersal of that resource line. That would that would that would go around having to go to all these different offices. It wouldn't be bothered by something that's not in the zoning, and just be put right to the right to the department who can handle it. And uh, so I, that's been here for a long time. I think we need to ramp it, revamp it. Not too many people know about it. Thank you, John. 
And I just say, um, Jim, I see you writing notes over there. I know you did such a great job of our first memo for the regulatory agreement. I'm sure you're starting to take notes, and that will definitely be one of the ones that we want to include in there. Councilor Turkelson. I just want to say one thing. What I did appreciate when, when Director Florence met with me was just about as far as using technology is also just making sure that we're um, – not trampling on a, a residence or a, you know citizens' rights as far as how much information we can share. Not all of that is legally allowed to be shared. There is a time frame that he has a requirement to do his job before he actually is in communication with me, the com person filing the complaint, because he's gathering his data, he's doing enforcement, or, or that's probably not the right word. Um, Investigation, yeah. Investigation. In investigation, yeah. but also if he's offering an option for mitigation is probably not the right word either, but an option to resolve the issue. So there's certain things that we can't be privy to. So in, that might be a Massachusetts general law thing versus where you are in other localities. I don't really know. But I did appreciate the, I'm going to use the word rigidity with which he does his job. It's more that it's very process oriented. And I appreciated that when I met with him. So I would never want him to undo that because that's what builds the case legally. Thank you. And, and I didn't I didn't want to throw this out there because I'm getting ahead of myself, but we do have a, there is a tracking number for every complaint that comes in. So that, that's probably available, but there may be some nuances to getting information off the system as a outside user. So I'll have to, I'm happy to look into it. But I think I want to thank you all for um, your time here today. And I also want to thank you for coming to see us. But more importantly, I want to thank our staff. These people work their guts out. They really do. They work their hearts out to do the right thing. I get letters upon letters thanking me and thanking uh, the town of Barnstable for hiring our staff. They work really hard to um, be transparent. They work really hard to be friendly, accommodating. And I couldn't do any of this without them. And so I appreciate what they do. And I just wanted to put that out there, that they're an amazing group of people. Brian, thank you again very much. Uh, we'll look forward to you know hearing some potential dates, set up a, uh, a tour, if you will, uh, in the near future to do that as well. Yes, sir. So, you have my word. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. I know that we do, I think, have a hard stop at 6, and we're getting close there. So as I mentioned before, we will uh, defer to our next meeting uh, items uh, E, uh, which is kind of following up on the form-based code discussion that we started last meeting. Um, so I, the next couple of things I think we can take care of fairly quickly. One was to identify uh, the meetings for our, our dates for our meetings in October. Um, and I wanted to suggest October 4th and October 18th, which again are Fridays at 3.30. Uh, we've cleared it with Sarah that they are available. So I guess I wanted to start to see if that works for everybody here. And that's Friday the 4th and the 18th. Yes. Yep. And anybody, anybody that can't, you won't be. Able? Can't make it. Okay. So John, one that can't make the 18th. Does that work for everybody else? October 4th and 18th. It's, looks good for me. <laughs> you okay? <laughs> which, which one is that? <laughs> It, I just end up with so many meetings during oh. certain weeks. It just it would be better for me if it were the other weeks. Oh. <laughs> but that's a, it's not my favorite. The week before the, the holiday. It's okay. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. It's okay. Okay. It's, it's really and, okay. And then we also have the town council meeting. They move theirs that week. So, all right. So we're going to go ahead and stick with the fourth and the eighteenth for now. It sounds like we'll have a quorum, three thirty. So our next meeting will be October fourth at three thirty. And as far as topics, I think. Um, you know, the item E on today's agenda, uh, the form-based code discussion, will probably take a majority of that, so we'll focus on that. I'll work on getting the draft agenda out. Uh, I'm actually going to be out of town this next week, uh, but I'll try and get that to Cynthia before I leave so we've got something so it'll get posted. Oh, yes, and then the last thing is uh, we want a motion to approve the minutes from, some, from September 6th. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Oh, go ahead, Kathy. I just have one really quick comment just sure. for you to keep in mind and for all of us to think about. The committee's set to sunset on October 31. That's about one month from now. Uh, we might want to think about 
uh, requesting, an, uh, you know, putting together a request to the council for an extension on that. But I think in doing that, we probably need to identify what it is we're going to be working on. Um, and I would suggest that you, as the chair, contact the chair of the ad hoc housing committee and find out what they're going to be doing, because their committee also sunsets on October 31. Zoning and housing are, re are really interrelated, so I think you need to try to find out well, what their plans are and if we can do things together. I think that would be really important. Sure, thank you, Kathy. Um, as a matter of fact, I've spoken to uh, spoke to the the chair of the housing ad hoc this morning. Uh, he indicated he expects that they'll go beyond that as well. I also made statements, public comment at both the housing and the LCP uh, meetings, you know, mentioning the fact that there are overlaps in the issues that we're discussing, and I thought it was important that we, you know, work to either have a meeting where members of each atten uh, group attends that. Jim and I have talked about that. We're still working on that, mm -hmm. looking at that sometime in October. And I also spoke with uh, President Penn, uh, and there was a full expectation that, you know, both our committee and the other ad hocs will likely be extended. Several of them, at least one or two, have not even met a single time yet. Uh, ours is the furthest along. Uh, but I think that we'll definitely need to go through November to accomplish the topics. And the feeling was that, you know, we might even need to go through December to cover all the topics. So, so, so we only have two meetings in October. I'm just telling we're, you. Yeah, we're, we're doing that right. two, two meetings in October right. and then, right. right. So, so we're, we, I'm just telling you, just, you know, we have two meetings in October. We have to agree to move forward and to give you the charge to prepare some kind of request to go to the council. Then the council has to vote on that. Yep. So we need to make sure that they vote on that and their second meeting in October is what I'm getting at, because if it ends up being in November, then we wouldn't have had our November meeting set yeah. up. That's what I'm getting at. I'll put yeah. something on the agenda for yeah. that for the next meeting. We can discuss that so we can get that in plenty of time before the 31st. So with that, a mo uh, Attorney Kelly? Oh, um, Friday, October 4th and October 18th. I'm sorry? I'm not available on Friday, October 4th, but I'm available the other three Fridays. Okay. Um, and I'm not available on the 18th, the or the 25th, excuse me. Do you have to be here, or could you have a representative? Or do we have to have any legal representation? I prefer to be here. I'd rather not put it off to somebody else. I apologize if that inconveniences the committee, but I could do the 11th, 18th. Well, the 11th, the 11th is a holiday weekend. I'm just saying for people that have Columbus Day weekend. Let's see. 11th. We could, uh, would I, I can reach out to Sarah and see what the availability is for the month of October. Okay. If the fourth and the other one doesn't work for people. There's also next Friday. I don't know if that's bad for people, but we still have one more September Friday. I'm going to be out of town next Friday, and I'm out of town on the 25th as well of October. Um, that's one of my favorite days. <laughs> <laughs> Would there, um, what, is October 3rd a Thursday a possibility? It is. is that, is that, that's, not okay. A not a possibility. Okay. Uh, Yeah, um, town council meeting. So, I said the third was not a possibility. Are they, are there any other days? Um, let's see. Would we do this by email? Yeah, it might be procedure. Okay. Yeah, why don't we, Cynthia, can you check? Send an email with what the uh, dates that might be available. Check on those. I will check with Sarah. And then maybe we either do a doodle poll or something. But uh, Yeah, because I also have to make sure that she has staff available because it takes three of her people to, to run one meeting. So Okay. All right. So um, then we do not have a firm date yet. We'll have to wait to hear back from you. and then We'll, set well the other up. two dates are booked. If she's going to hold those, but if they're not convenient, she'll switch them um, with some dates that are available. Okay. I guess, Kate, the only question is, is there someone who might be able to be there in your absence? It sounds like at this point uh, you're the only one that could not make the fourth. 
Would there be other representation from the legal department to listen in? Okay. I can look into it, um, or if I just missed the meeting. I just, I don't think it's feasible for me to send somebody, but I, I can. Okay. Why, why don't we, well, let's keep the 4th and the 18th right now, as you said, and um, you know, if you could look into that, Kate. In the meantime, if you can send us a list of any other alternative dates, Cynthia, to the group, then we can see if we can either find an alternative date or maybe we'll end up working with the 4th and the 18th. Okay. Great. Motion to adjourn? So. Second. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, particularly for staying so late on a Friday.